you know what I'm saying, until our first topic. I'm glad everybody that made it, you know what I'm saying. Welcome to uh, Code Talk Season 1, Episode 5. I was trying to get us a good layout, man. Like, I can see it on my screen, and it keeps me on point. Um, but for some reason, it's just, we have some technical difficulties, and we're going to work through it. You know what I'm saying? It would be better for Episode 6, you know what I'm saying? I promise that much. But this, this format has been rocking for us anyway. So, we ain't finna get disappointed by how it didn't display. In the meantime, everybody can hear us, you know what I'm saying? And, and um, you know, you gotta, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the fact that, you know, we're actually getting the right kind of feedback that make these com these organic conversations normal, you know what I'm saying? Because we all got a story that, you know what I'm saying, at some point crosses the same path with each other, right? And it don't matter where we come from. So, um, but... With that being said, man, I want to go on to the first topic, man. Did you watch Killer Mike's Trigger Warning? Man, I was waiting on that. Ever since you mentioned that last week that he was coming out with that show, I've been I was sweating last Friday. <laughs> like I was sweating that. Like as soon as I turned it on, he was gonna have a check for me. Like that's how I was ready. I was locked and loaded. I might have popped some popcorn, man, because I, I knew he wasn't gonna disappoint. And that dude, I might like him just speaking more than I like his music. Because I'm a fan of his music too. Yeah, and that's but and him, that's saying something right there too. Speaking, bro. I just want to hear the I just hear the I just want to hear the boy talk, man. Like he if he don't motivate you to do a little something, my nigga, you it, it just ain't it. You ain't got no ears. You know what I'm saying? Oh man, he is he's a pre, he is what I feel like the biblical thing. Yep. He in the street. Yeah. Well, like he had a um he had a line um uh in the uh on his album uh, God in the Building. Oh uh, well, Pledge Allegiance right. to the Ground Two. A uh, Pledge Allegiance to the Ground Two and a song called God in the Building. That's a classic. He Part said he, he had a bar on that. He said, if Jesus came back, baby, where do you think he'd be? Probably in the streets with me. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And and then the hook was, you know what I'm saying, came through the valley of the shadow with death. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and he goes from that point, you know, uh, um, you know, painting the picture of, of his early beginnings. You know what I'm saying? And the man is true to the root of, of Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Not the new Atlanta. I'm talking about that old Atlanta, you know. When Willie Sherwood allowed that, that's what I'm talking about. That right there, and everything that he has done, you know, uh, and made visible, like whether he's been on a panel on Bill Maher, um, you know, sitting alongside guys like Robert Reich, who was part of Obama's finance administration, and you know, like he can. He's been able to carry himself, whether he be talking about gun rights and some of the stuff he, he, he discussed sometimes is a little radical. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah. And, but the thing is, though, you in a room full of crazy cats, bro. So you got to be a little bit crazier than them to get your point across sometimes. And his whole thing is introducing new ideas. So I'm going to sound radical. If everything I'm saying, you've never heard before. Right. And, and we've gotten to the point now where... You know, we, we haven't been able to um, digest new concepts by, you know what I'm saying, depending on the source or whatever. But, like, we're, we're reaching a point now, man, like, we don't have to care what nobody thinks if we're not already there. At least I haven't cared what nobody thinks for at least the last five or six years, you know what I'm saying, to the point where I've been able to articulate, you know what I'm saying, my points or whatever. But, like, um, some of the things that he was doing are in line with some of the things that I wrote about in my book, man, I, I thoroughly believe that black people already have every resource we need in order to be rich. You know what I'm saying? I think the other resource, uh, I think we have the basic ingredients, not necessarily all of the resources. Let me the say resources. that one. Okay. Right. The resources usually include networks, you know what I'm saying? The right conversations, stuff like that. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, you have to be, um, you know, like my man Mike just said, you got to be a radical nowadays in order to shift things into normal, which is true. You can't go get so far to one side, bro. You can't go get the Care Bears to kill Venom. You know what I'm saying? No. Like thoughts and prayers ain't fixing that, bro. You know what I'm no. saying? You no. gotta, 
you got to operate off of people's anger, but be responsible with it. And I think that's what Killer Mike is real good at, especially in that scene where he was talking about creating religion. You know what I'm saying? When he brought yes. Sleepy out and, the book, and of sleep. the book of Sleep, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like how many? Like you said, you even said today, like that you was tired about something. I think it was the the kids and the blackface, and you know what I'm saying at that at that, uh, mm -hmm. that oh, school. Man. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That that's yeah. not that's not a topic right now. I want more information to come out on that shit because them idiots is already on Fox News talking crazy, talking about. Yeah, they ain't even cleaning it up, bro. They that's the funny part, and not to get off on a tangent, but these assholes got on there and said that's how we show our school spirit. But I'm gonna leave it right nah, there. We're not doing it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not doing that. <laughs> we gotta go do. We can't do it today. We're leaving it right there. Yeah. No, we're not doing that. Yeah, but we'll come back to that joint. But like. When you said you was tired, and the fact that Killer Mike was talking about the book of sleep, I chose Sleepy as my guy because he always looks sleepy. He makes you calm when you're around him. You know what I'm saying? And and he was talking about, um, you know, black people just tired in general. You know, we don't ever get a chance to rest. And then when you look at the context of what sleep means for black people, when we used to get, you know, some of the slave uh, uh, slaves used to get beat for oversleeping. That was the most. That, that part right there. That part right there killed me. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like. And, and, and it's not like I didn't, like, it's not one of the things I couldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? It was one of the things that I had overlooked. You know what I'm saying? Right, for so when long. you heard it, he was like, Dang. Yeah, yeah, like, he yeah, always. Even now, even yeah. when he brought it up, too, if you, uh, you ain't got time to be sleep. Like, we always tell, like, sleep is for the week and nothing comes to a sleeper and all that. Like, we're yeah. promoting not sleeping. I don't, get, I don't get tired. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, sleep is the cousin of death. You know, I'm like. Yeah, I get tired. You know what I'm saying? I'm 10.30. 10 10.30, you ain't getting nothing out of me. You know what I'm saying? Better be in the mercy. So, For sure. Yeah. Um, and the emergency out here because I might be chopping laws right here. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, absolutely. So, um, so where we are right now uh, uh, within that is that, yo, know, the, the funny parts that I saw in there is uh, when he put uh, learning a trade with pornography. It sounded crazy, you know what I'm saying? Again, we talking about him being a radical, right? And but people was there for it, you know what I'm saying? They they, they were there, and when he did the pretest before the pornography was included in the actual trade, you know, uh, um, mm -hmm. they they was like they was some dummies, you know what I'm saying? Based on the right. based on the outcome, they they mixed the porn with the trade, and you know what I'm saying? And and it. And it their uh, results shot up 75%. Like, all of this sounds so crazy, but, like, they had a little bit of, uh, they had uh, porn that fits everybody's appetite in that thing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, it was a nice little smoke is going up there. Yeah, straight up. And, but you couldn't deny the metrics. And then when he took those metrics to go talk to that trade school, I can't remember the name, where he talked to the guy that was responsible for education there. He, um, you know, he was like, um, you know, I, I think I want to sit down and listen to it. So, and it's no, and when he watched it and he saw the results, he couldn't deny the metrics that it produced, you know, the he, killer Mike's ability to produce metrics that folks have to, you know what I'm saying? Respect, um, as fact that that was his talent, you know what I'm saying? Shining through at that moment in time, you know what I'm saying? And it shows you. Again, like some of the things that I, you know, I, I wrote about in my book is that, bro, we can be more than one thing at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We can, we can, you can go to the strip club and still be a CEO. You know what I'm saying? You can. You, That's just entertainment. Like what I do ain't who I am. Yeah. In most cases. In I'm most cases. Some, some foul shit. Now, I'm on my head breaking the law. I'm a criminal. But yeah. In most cases, how I entertain myself and how I have fun is. That can't define me. No. You can't be out here doing that. No, no. And, and, and even then, you don't have the whole picture. You know what I'm saying? So, right. It's and that, just a third of my day. Right. You know, so, man, it's um, it, it's refreshing. I, I thoroughly uh, endorse, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what my endorsement means, <laughs> but I think everybody should go on Netflix and check out Trigger Warning. And Watch it, man. It, watch it twice. Yeah, like, you're you going to miss something if you don't watch it twice. You know, watch it twice, man. So, and uh, the other part, I like the beautiful part at the end, where like we just we tied all in, we live black, we made a religion, 
we made a product. Like, oh, we didn't talk about Cripple Cola yet, man. We we got it. Yeah, we got it. No, no, don't skip over Cripple Cola. Okay, yeah, like before we get to the end of it, right? Uh, uh, before we get to the end of this particular topic, we got two more topics to talk about because, um, well, you got three because the beginning starts off with him trying to live black on the economy, mm-hmm. and that didn't go over so well. And what happened is that it pretty much codified that it's difficult to as black people to keep the dollar black after so long. Six hours, bro. Six hours. He had a metric on there. He said that the Jewish dollar stays in their community 31 days, right? And then he had um, the white community on there for like 23 days or something like that. And uh, the Asian community was like uh, in the high 20s. And then it said black people, the dollar stayed in the community six hours. Hours. Hours, bro. Like, that's not even a full hours. day's work. That, that's no. crazy. And, and then when I thought about it, like when I see numbers, I try to put myself within the numbers so I can see if it's true or not, right? And my, my little Amazon cart, you know what I'm saying, while, while it's getting loaded up at my desk, I'm getting ready to go ahead and cash out before I get off work. So it might be it might be four to five hours. You know four what I'm saying? Four to five hours. You know what I'm saying? Well, online shopping, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that speeds it up. That's yeah. nuts, man. But then, our dollar leaves work early every day. Every, yeah, our, our dollar gets off work before we do. That's that's terrible. That's real terrible. Yo, your, your money's spent before you even, you know what I'm saying, submit your timesheet. You know? Um, like, what happens in those 30 days? Like, if I go... So that that's a good question, right? Like if that means if I go like if I go to a I'm a Jewish person, I go to a Jewish grocery store and I buy some bread. And we simulating right now because we don't know. Right. And I buy I give you my three dollars for the bread, and now I'm assuming that money then gets deposited into a Jewish bank. Yep. Which is then turned around and give it as long out. It give it right, giving this loan to yeah. Jewish people. To start Jewish people come into the bank to withdraw. It's coming out my Jewish ATM. Or, or or they start new businesses that are Jewish. <laughs> Cause they gonna get loans. Yo, right, that's what's gonna happen, and it's gonna be close. I'm saying I'm, I might be building something right next to the bank because yeah, I'm not leaving the area. I'm not leaving the area. No, if I'm getting money here and I'm spending money here, why I gotta leave? So. Like when you I think st- that's the point. Yeah, that's like, absolutely the point. You know what I'm saying? We, we never have to see y'all. Right, but but this is the thing though. That's what the Tulsa race riots are so important about because <clears throat> even during that time frame, the black dollar stayed in the community 33 days in that time frame. And they don't ever tell us about that. And, like, we did it one time before. Yeah, but this is the thing though. Every time that we've done it, we've been burned out by white people who have been choked out. Um by by uh, the, the segregation that they believe in, you know ensures their quality of life because black people in Tulsa wasn't living on the other side of their tracks by by choice they were living over there by force so the minute that you know what I'm saying that they couldn't benefit from it they saw that black people had eleven churches and eleven banks they had thirty three millionaires living in the in the economy within that community. And the dollar stayed in that community. They didn't have to go outside of it. It was self-contained. So, yeah, a lot of people don't know the metrics, bro. You know what I'm saying? I Like, I can post them facts later on, but, like, that's what was going on. So, now, the lie that was told to spark off the Tulsa race riots was, you know, associated with the same way folks used to do shit to, to, to justify, you know, killing us in our own communities. And that was that mm-hmm. they said a black man came across the tracks and raped a white woman in their city. Get the fuck out of here. That's so trash, man. It's so trash. And it's unbelievable. And that was grounds to treat us like, that was grounds to terminate the city. Yeah. Or terminate the, the area. Yeah. According to them. You know? So. But, and it's just so cold that they always had that, that joke, that, that the big joke. They got the big joke. Because when all they dirty tactics don't work, we could always just kill them. Yeah, like for real. Like we 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 failed to to make them cause dissension of one another. They saw our tactics there, you know. 
we passed laws and they circumvented the law by being creative, you know what I'm saying, with their own individual resources. So that didn't work either. You know what we'll do? We'll just make up a lie and then just justify a way we can use our own resources to go kill them. They can't do, and at that point in society, they couldn't do anything else but kill us. And they had to, and they, and this other thing too, it wasn't just a mob of white people. It was a mob of white people in federal uniforms. You know what I'm saying? They used the National Guard. Right. They conducted the first airstrikes on us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So keeping a dollar in the black community that kill, you know what I'm saying, that Killer Mike was highlighting was, uh, um, to me, it was a segue for you to go back and look and find out when we were able to keep the dollar in the black community. And let's let's also uh, highlight this part. Um, Tulsa, Oklahoma wasn't the only place where black people were burned out of being being prosperous. You know what I'm saying? You had Wilmington, North Carolina, numerous, uh, uh, you know, like uh, white mob led um, attacks on black people in New York. You know what I'm saying? Specifically in Harlem. And you had East St. Louis where the police, you know what I'm saying, have run them up. But the police have always been the agent of white supremacy. You know what I'm saying? No matter how you do the map. Like, Virginia had casual killing laws, you know? That in they the, tend to enforce it all the time. Yeah. Like, every business got a security guard. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and look, the, po the police uh, is a French term that was founded out of, you know, um, well, it was legitimized through white, you know, uh, uh, landowners like post Reconstruction to police up newly freed slaves. You know what I'm saying? So, like, they have always been the agent, you know. And but I've never really faulted anybody that decided to become a police officer to work in their community. You know, like because that's how it should be. We got to get. That's another topic. Mm -hmm. that, that's really another topic, man. Because like we the only generation that spent. 30 years saying fuck the police and then making the police unpopular. But we get mad when we see a whole bunch of white cops in our own communities. You know what I'm saying? We got to do... Because we made it, yeah. Because we made we, it uncool to be a cop. You like, made it uncool. Even and when... That's we, how it used to be. You should be policing the same street you rode your bike on. Bro, even when we played cops and robbers on the block, nobody wanted to play the yeah, cop because be the cop. cop was a pussy ass bitch. And if you yes. played the cop, nigga, you got your ass kicked. That was the that was a lyric from the Ghetto Boys. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it, but, but it was the truth, though. You know what I'm saying? And and the thing is, is that the whole economy piece that um the black economy piece that that Killer Mike was speaking on is it spoke to me in certain levels where you know we got to be layered about how we protect what we get too. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. which is another, you know, another topic in itself, man. But like, so we have talked about the economics piece that you brought up because he gave us building blocks, right? We talked about the religion piece. Uh, we talked about the educational piece because he told some kids to throw away their dreams. You know what I'm saying? Like, but if you don't. Oh, man, that yeah. might have been my favorite part when he was the classroom <laughs> with the little kids. Yeah, but the thing is, if we talk about it, they won't get it. You know what I'm saying? If they haven't seen it. If they haven't seen it. But yeah. the thing was, the, the overarching message message in him telling them kids to throw their dreams away was we need expectation management. You know what I'm saying? L L little nuck nuck ain't good at algebra or problem solving. You know what I'm saying? No. We can't let them say when they're going to become brain surgeon and astronauts mm -hmm. because it becomes an all or none situation. There's no in between. You can't decide, I'm going to go to college to go become a ear, nose, and throat surgeon, and then you strike out, and now you work, work at the bowling alley because you don't overshot no. your expectations. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Exactly. So, we need little nut nut trying to learn how to work on a diesel engine. Yeah. <laughs> Change tires. You know what I'm saying? Yes, man. Like, get get hey, nothing up to trade. Hey, because you those... Get paid, get paid, get paid. Yeah, he need to learn a trade, and then we need to teach him how to earn it, how to own his trade and employ other people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's more than one. It's more than one way to get it. Yeah, like, like you were saying a couple a couple episodes ago, everybody don't need college. No, no. Some people gonna go to college, get a bunch of debt, and still just be you know what I'm saying slow <laughs> and in the way. You know what I'm saying? In the way, you ain't learn shit, bro. So, with that being said, you know, like the culminating event on 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 Killer Mike's trigger warning when he started New Africa. 
when, when he created his own country, you know what I'm saying? When he found out what it took to do that, was that not epic? Hell yes. The part where he had, he knew that somebody else needed to take them into the new Africa. Man, look. Right? Like, yeah, come true. on, man. Because he didn't you want gonna, all the glory. You gonna build a country and do that at the same time? Yeah, and it's the thing. He put himself out there, you know what I'm saying, and they pretty much, he put himself on the flag. I like all of the intentional stuff he did because initially it came off as like, oh yeah, you start your own country, but you got yourself on the flag, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nothing wrong with the flag either, you know, because he had himself on it. But then he was the, he was also there in person with certain pains and stuff like that. The forefathers should get that kind of credit and that kind of accolades, you know what I'm saying? You got to know from whence you came. If we agree with yes, that. Yes, I founded the country. Can we respect that one time? Yeah, like we gotta we gotta respect that one time, right? So after that part was established and then things were going left to right based on, you know what I'm saying, people's personal objections to certain things, they held an election. You know, like and even though Mike, you know what I'm saying, got uh I'm pretty sure he got reelected, but you saw when he changed the vote. Mm-hmm. You know, because he in himself knew that they needed a culture shock. You know what I'm saying? They needed to believe in somebody else other than him. Because, like, Americans are complacent. Like, how many times have we seen the incumbent president not get reelected if they run? Not most of the time you go back to back if you want. To. That's what I'm saying. You go back to back in America if you're the president, right? That's why a lot of people, like, and I'm of the opinion that. Guys like Trump can absolutely get reelected, you know. Um, now the constituency is changing, you know what I'm saying, um, amongst the senators and House representatives and stuff that are being being uprooted by minority women, you know. Uh, that that's a variable that can't be overlooked. However, when it comes down to what Americans feel emotionally sound with. They could easily go back and reelect Trump, despite no matter whatever whatever he got going on. Do we disagree with that? No, we don't disagree. But you know who's not mad about that? The me, the the same Jewish folks that got their money. Right. No, the, exactly. The Asian community they got they got their money. You know what I'm saying? Even, I wonder how much time they put into that. Like how like they don't even flinch, a, bro. I don't think they just flinch. see if the name changes. Okay, who is this guy? Bro, oh, yeah, that's why y'all y'all miss some shit. Bro, and I just go back to <laughs> Yeah. Like, oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna go play some golf. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. This shit finna get crazy. I, I, I got I got some Jewish friends that ain't never flinched or ever brought it up and said it was a problem. Matter of fact, the only time I heard anything from the Jewish community was when that synagogue got shot up by that white dude. Of course it's a white dude. Um of course. you know what I'm saying, a few months ago. And it was like we don't want you here. You know what I'm saying? But like everybody was like, yeah, jumping on their side and giving away their empathy and stuff. And I was like, let me go do a little research real quick because I feel pretty certain that the state of Pennsylvania gave their vote, their electoral vote to Trump. And sure enough, I went and looked. Sure enough. The state of Pennsylvania, you know what I'm saying, gave up their vote to Trump. Not necessarily in Philadelphia, but in that area where that synagogue was shot up, you know, their vote was part of the... The red blocks that got filled in. You know what I'm saying? So see, yeah. Because so, they probably don't even participate, right? Well, they do, but this is the thing. They gonna cast their vote for their interest. You know what I'm saying? Because they always been about their own people, as I think everybody should. Not a big deal. You know what I'm saying? Um so I wonder how many of them voted for the businessmen. Man, look, well they all businessmen. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like they gonna vote on behalf of what benefits the businessman. You know, like that's, that's, that's I can't. Kind of wild though. And I can't say that we wouldn't vote the same way if if our businesses, if we had a multiple amounts of businesses that everybody was successful at, we're gonna make the vote that's pragmatic. You know what I'm saying to our economic san- uh, um, security. And I'm not saying that I would have voted for them. All I'm saying is is that. We can't dismiss that idea, you know, in these days and times because people look at us in our face and then go do some dumb shit, you know what I'm saying, right off the bat. And then and then apologize for it, right? Right. You know, so we got multiple layers 
of why somebody would blow us off if it, if they can benefit from from it. So, um, all I'm saying is is that um, you know we can't dismiss certain things anymore. You know, we got it's too many different variables in this wild version of what we in right now. You know what I'm saying? You know, hey man, look, I want to check a sound effect right quick. You know what I'm saying? Hey, could you hear that? Uh-uh. Okay, good. You can't hear. It. Don't worry about it. I had like an evil laugh. You know what I'm saying? That it was bothering oh, me. I, yeah, I, I got some sound effects and all that shit, man. It just didn't come through tonight. You know, it, it pumped fake oh, on yeah, me. Man. You know what I'm oh, saying? Yeah. But we, we gotta work the buzz out. Yeah, we gonna work the buzz out. It's all good, man. But you know what I'm saying? Like th- th- this, this our panel. This is how we see the world. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm sure we reflect a lot of views of a lot of different people. You know, so, um, but like. The country, the country culmination of his idea was awesome. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't have nothing negative to say about the whole presentation of it. Um, I like the fact that they did the religion piece in a strip club that was, you know what I'm saying, organic to where they were. Legendary. Legendary. Straight up. You know what I'm saying? They like, ain't got no wings, though. Yeah, they ain't no wings. They ain't no wings. Because, like, think about like think about the, uh, the symbolism in that, too, right? Black people... Go, it, you just the part where he talked to Creflo Dollar. Boy, he got so many gems in this thing, right? Oh my goodness. And, and Creflo was starting to feel him. Yeah, yeah, Creflo was, yeah, because like, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the song that you know, what I'm saying, Killer Mike had with it. It'll come to me. I wish I had, you know, what I'm saying, like, if I had my stream things working uh, uh the right way, I could play a snippet of. Of the song, you know what I'm saying, where he challenged Creflo, and, and uh, was it no? It was Eddie Long. Oh yeah, that was was that God in the Building Part Two? No, that was uh, That's Life Part Two. That's Life Part Two. Yeah, yeah. That killer Mike strings might be going up tonight. Yo, it got to be. It got to be. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, in that in that situ- in that situation where, you know, Creflo was loyal to his. His current stances that was going to benefit his own um, congregation, but he left enough nuggets on that thing to, to, to that you could tell that he talked to Killer Mike, and said, "Hey man, I need to edit this." You know what I'm saying? Because like, and they muted some stuff on there too. You know, I like that. I wish I could hear that whole conversation. Hear that whole conversation because that was a good conversation. They was about to have. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, um. But uh, that's uh did you see how big that church was, man? The the, the church was a stadium. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Like like oh I've seen that gosh. church. Did you see the amount of people that were going in and out of it? It looked like somebody showing up for the Atlanta Hawks game. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's what it looked like. I could have swore I saw something that said general admission on the front. Mm-hmm. Like what? Man, like <sighs> like should we so in that regard, right? Should we be offended that people don't do for I'm the culture? Offended. You offended, or I'm offended. or should we be? I don't know how to take that. So like, like, or, or, like on one side, I can say that we could be thoroughly offended. I would have been offended maybe five or six years ago, you know. Uh, but today, I'm like, there's still some some hope in that situation that. There's a lot of people that think the way that, you know what I'm saying, that we do. Uh, and I hate saying it like that, but people got their own independent thoughts that align with what we think, you know? Right. And it's bigger than just... And we just haven't had the conversation. Yeah, because yeah. I don't want to come <laughs> off as though we we insult anybody's intellect. You know no, what I'm saying? That. I'm not into that. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I, I just think, just looking at the size of that church, right? We not doing enough. We can't be. Cause if if we could build one black man's church, like what if so that size, we, we it's not enough going on in that community. What that if I mean, what if everybody that's watching that's dialed into this right now sent each other like like everybody in the thread sent one person a hundred bucks? Hmm. How does that change their life? Somebody just made rent early. Er- Somebody might have just, you know what I'm saying, got the down payment on the house. On a for sure. And the only pay- I even peaked up at the thread. But right. there was like 12 people in there when I, just hit, when, when I was just over there. And that's what I'm saying. And it's going to be more people that's going to catch up on it later. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's- 
We're not doing enough. That yeah. church is huge, man. Right. We should see. See, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying about. I don't care that they get the money. I'm not. Families, if you bringing in that kind of money, if you putting that kind of money into the community, I don't know if we can be mad at your Lambo. No, I, you if can't you're be putting that money in the community. the community. If the community is already built up and programs are already established to get people out the street, you know, jobs. You should be jobs. Every, like that thing should be running like a black people city hall, man. Big as it is. But but that's what I'm saying, man. Like we already have seen the blueprint for it. You know what I'm saying? Like the Tulsa race riots. I'd argue that those communities flourished because they were centered on the church and and the banks. Because they had, like, I look at numbers, you know what I'm saying? And this might be me reaching or whatever. But if you take the correlation of 11 churches and 11 banks and 33 millionaires living in that small community, you can't, there's no way you could take their belief system out of their prosperity. Right. <laughs> because the money is tied directly where they had a faith center there, right? I can see it. Yeah. So at that point, if we had grown up in Tulsa and Tulsa had been untouched or we were products of a community that mirrored itself off of Tulsa, we'd be devout Jesus followers because there's nothing to say that it doesn't work because everything that you could say that we that they prayed for or worked towards, like they did the due diligence that it took to dignify whatever it is that made them financially uh, affluent, right? Right. So we will function differently, you know. Uh, we will think differently, you know. And and my point is, is that we can do more, but we need the people that are doing the best that have the resources to want to see the community do more. They want. We need to see them like aside from complaining, because ain't nothing worse right. than somebody that's black that's complaining. You know what I'm saying? Um, right. And okay, maybe you, you, maybe it, it could be just as simple as I'm, I'm just gonna say Creflo because that's who's in the thing. Creflo had a what if, what if he had a message that wasn't divided, uh, that didn't divide because because he, he's already because he's already established, so he ain't gonna lose the people that that, that that's with him. Yeah, but. The only thing keeping the people that can help from helping might just be their religious beliefs. And, and, and what, that's what I'm saying. Like, he's got established credibility among a certain faction of people, right? So if he right. changed his message, they're going to follow. That's my point. So like a more generalized mm -hmm. message, not necessarily Christian Jesus, right. but more black empowerment. And Shit, hell, I'm changing this whole damn mess and saving this and saving ourselves. And I'll change the man's speech. Mm -hmm. I just think that's a better message right now than us trying to go where our God is. Yep. I'm not a Methodist. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a nation of Islam. I'm not any of that stuff. I'm just myself. I'm not really a even though I grew up in the church for most of my life, like sung in the choir, did all that stuff. Yeah. But you know, as you get older, you learn stuff, learn different stuff. We have yeah. different conversations. Some, different some things are, here. some things are more or less applicable. Yeah. So I think the, 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 the black empowerment co code of Code of ethics, I guess. A code of like our code. Just a code. code, code shit. A code. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of code, that should be the. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, and that that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's the link? Yeah. Hey, I gotta put the link in that thing, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to do it now. So. I think I just think that message would be better, sir. Yeah. Not Bible, Scripture, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think we should be us empower us. Make us more efficient. Make us a self-contained entity, in, entity. Like that's what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Cause we've been like the Jesus thing is, it's 
you know how they say some stuff is tried and true? Yeah. Been trying Jesus. Right. I, I don't know how true it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Man, um, I, 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 I got my opinions about religion, and I'm not, I don't want to challenge nobody to change that debate. Uh, right now, um, I, I think that the whole point of it all is that we need alternative views, and Killer Mike did a good job of presenting that. You know, um, I like to see him follow up, and uh, the the what was it like six episodes or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like it, and I was mad at them six. <laughs> like it wasn't enough, right? You know, I got to the end like, nah, man, we ain't doing this. Right. Six episodes. Mm-hmm. Nah. I know he had enough for ten. Yeah. So I want to see them edits. The police. That's I want to see all that stuff. Hey, them them edits got to be sick, bro. You know. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna move on to the next topic, man. We're gonna talk about some black myths, man. Yeah, let's get them popping. Right. Those are all, those those are like opening a fortune cookie. Yeah, yeah, like we're gonna go down it too, man. Like I got five of them that I put up there. Um and so let me talk start with the top one, right? Um my friend Andrea that got on here the last time, she she had one that said black women are unapproachable in movies. Alright. Um let's see here. She had um then after that, we had uh, my man, uh, Markel Brandon, said whipping your kids is an effective discipline. Uh, number three was the origins and the validity of the Willie Lynch letter. I have seen a lot on that. I haven't personally read it, but those are the ones that he submitted. I'm going to try to reach out to Chad in a minute. Um, I, yeah, 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 we need to get him to talk about that because I haven't read those either. Yeah, I, I've seen enough to know that it's a plausible reason why it's not accurate yeah. um, mm-hmm. because it's it's too it's too specific you know what I'm saying based on the era of time but anyway um, number four was black on black crime and number five I'm taking that one is burdens disguised as unconditional love oh here we go yes yeah, I, see, I see why you take it out yes yeah, you should go for it Go for a ride. Yeah, man. So, like, let's get back to number one. Man, black women are unapproachable and mean false. And let me go ahead and, and inform some of the male listeners out there that subscribe to this myth. Sometimes your game is just trash, man. Yes. Let's just, uh, Straight up. Let's just go ahead and call it what it is. Yep. Your your game was trash. Your, your outfit was trash. Your shoes was trash. <laughs> like, you approached her in a hefty bad manner, mm-hmm. therefore that would have pissed me off too, so, so yeah let's, so, let's so go now, ahead and get that out the way so now you on the curb on Thursday like everything else, yes so um, that boy got stretch pants <laughs> hey hey, hey. <laughs> hefty, hefty, um, hefty so so um, I do think that that assessment or that myth gets um, propagated based on one or two interactions where um, the guy hasn't fully uh, observed his surroundings and where you should or should not approach a woman. Um, I I think that when you um, introduce certain topics too soon, um, you know, you like my man LJ just said, you said you got to approach him with confidence. But they don't necessarily mean they want to be approached. And that goes back to your situation awareness and reading the situation. Like, for instance, if you see a woman working out at the gym, that's probably the worst place to approach a woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when she's about to get off work, if you see a girl leaving out of a place, a business, a store, wherever, and she looks like she just got off, you know, so. Yeah. That might not be the time. No, it can't be. You know, it, it's like. I don't want to be bothered under certain circumstances. Not saying that I got to deal with, you know, saying like that type of energy or whatever, because I'm a married man and I'm not putting myself in those situation where, you know, saying those environments invite that type of situation. Mm-hmm. So, but like when I was single, you know, I was very careful about where, you know, what I'm saying I would commit my energy to, you know what I'm saying? Like you got to sit back and observe like, man, do she look like she want to be approached? 
Mm-hmm. You gotta be able to read all that, man. Yeah, yeah. And, and and the thing is, you gotta be able to read all that. So, and what I feel like is that when you mix in some of the leadership or some of the guidance from some of the toxic males that some guys may have been, you know, what I'm saying under the tutelage of over this period of time, where they tell you, you know, you gotta dust yourself off and try again and stuff like that. You know, you gotta keep going. Like men don't get the process rejection for real. You know what I'm saying? We get the we got to keep going hard. You know, like oh she, oh she won't holler at you. It don't matter. Go get the next one. You know. Go get the next one. But instead we, of processing what we could do better. Yeah. What did I mess up? What's up with the lessons learned? You know, what what happened to you know? Uh, I I think one of the things that I I found to be trash was. Asking a woman for a number, you know what I'm saying? Because everybody else was doing that, and I didn't want to be like that dude, the, the dude that was always doing it. So when I was single, I'd be like, "Yo, here's my number. You already know I'm interested in you. You know what I'm saying? Hit me up when you get time." Because the message is, if I ask you for your number, then I'm only gonna talk to you when I'm available. Mm-hmm. But if you give, if I give her my number. And, you know what I'm saying, I leave the right impression, why wouldn't she hit me up? Unless she's just emotionally unavailable. You got to be able to gauge that. You know what I'm saying? You you got to find a way to create a circumstance where you empower the other person. Because you are already motivated by what you already see. You know what I'm saying? It may take a second for that person to catch up emotionally. You know what I'm saying? They may not be ready for that. They may not trust you. You don't know what the previous experience was or whatever. But if you just sit and... These, these, uh, you know what I'm saying, confrontational ambushes, these emotional ambushes, <laughs> and these chauvinistic ambushes, you're going to get, you know what I'm saying, like, what you put into it. Like, that woman don't owe you nothing, bro. You know what I'm saying? No. Yeah. So. She don't owe you the time to stop and see what you want. No, at all. Because, like, I walk past people begging all the time. Hmm. You and know you get my conversation when I'm walking back and forth from work. Right. Don't, I mean, but, like, from that point of view, if you can't put yourself in a position where you looking like you emotionally homeless, you can't understand what she's doing, you know? Mm. You know? And then, For sure. and then, like, you remember that story you was telling me uh, about, um, you know, you was at work, and then the chick had got beat up, and then the last person she wanted to see was another uh, another man to come to her mm-hmm. aid, even eat her, come to her aid, even though you was just really checking on her on a right. well-being and stuff. And then the woman blow the, you know what I'm saying? And the woman that, that, that worked with you blew her off too because there's some women that don't give a shit about other black women either, you know? Mm-hmm. But the point is, is that when you in that situation and you already feel alone and then your feeling is reciprocated by actions from somebody else that's causing you, you know what I'm saying, like a, a, a level of um, insecurity when it comes down to your safety... You can't trust a whole lot of people, but we don't, as men, we don't have to ever deal with that. We don't have to worry about, you know, like whether or not our safety is in question if some woman try to question us, you know what I'm saying, or talk to us or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, yep. it's um, the same thing with the chick walking down, she could be leaving a party or whatever, and uh, it, it might just be a guy that generally is trying to approach her in the correct way. Mm-hmm. And my but mind, she don't right. She don't know that. She don't know how to respond to that shit. I walk faster. Right. Like like we ain't never had to go nowhere and be like, man, I hope these women don't beat my ass tonight. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying or something like that. Like my man Mike said, he said we shouldn't overlook how some of us men treat women as a result, as a reason why women can be standoffish. And he hit the, you know, he brought the same, you know, what I'm saying assessment to what we're talking about right now, what we always been on, you know, like. As men, we can't take we can't we can't take offense to the fact that every woman ain't gonna want to talk to your ass. Man, and it's it makes you uncomfortable when you see a guy talking to or a, a female talking to a guy that she's really not trying to talk to right now. Yeah, and and, and he trying to you know what I'm saying handle it like a um uh, you know what I'm saying like a snake charm or some shit or. Or, or right. somebody that like, and work in a zoo, you know, like you, you can exactly. already, especially when you can read, like, yo, she's not interested, bro, and you at keep all. on trying, you know what I'm saying? And then when you get shot, when he gets shot down, he look at you like, like, oh, she ain't talking about that no way. I'm like, no, fam, you was trash right there. Yeah. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the whole thing. Yeah. I yeah. saw it happen. Yeah. So you you, you ain't have a chance. Swing and a miss. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
denied. You get, get that out of here, man. And it's like, you got to get, sometimes you got to be able to tap into your emotional side to be able to gauge that. Yeah, like, what would you want to deal with right now? Exactly. You, you don't know what kind of day she had. You don't know what kind of phone call she had just before you decided to approach her. If she got kids, you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know the if she's with the kid's father or not. You don't know that, that dynamic. It's too many layers, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Which is why, like, if you see her and you see where she's located, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you should try to, uh, you know, just use good judgment, man. Like, would you want to be approached every, every spot you're in, you know? Right. And go ahead and make the approach. Nobody likes to stand out every aisle, bro. You know, went down six aisles staring at this chick. Yeah. Will you go talk to her, man, so she can tell you no when you keep trying? Yeah, like, <laughs> that way you don't look like she got to call the police on you. That way she ain't got to worry about you coming in the parking yeah. lot behind her. You know, follow that girl from the frozen pizza to the taco season. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, it, that, that shit just look real desperate and garbage, man. That don't mean make that. Make your move, bro. Like, like make your move, get shot down, and just say, you know, I apologize or some shit like that. And go yeah. on and grab them hot pockets. Yeah, get, get them hot pockets there. and get the fuck on up out of here, man. I get out of there. Get the Jamaican, get the Jamaican beef patty though. You know what I'm saying? Like they got that jerk season in mm-hmm. it. I heard they were fire. They they pretty fire. You know what I'm saying? But do do you think? The amount of women you're around daily has anything to do with how you approach women? Uh, absolutely. Like you have to, you have to be able to relate to people that you are around. You know what I'm saying? Like, like look how think about how dumb you would be if you were around women all the time and you can't listen and relate to them without having a transactional relationship. Meaning, I got to do something for you in order for me, right. you know what I'm saying, to be here. And and if you ain't got, no, if you got an ulterior motive, you definitely can't see what the point of view they're coming from. You just taking what they saying and you trying to lay the groundwork so you can get out of it what you can benefit from. So you can be you just trying to get some neck. You just try to get some neck. That's it. You know what I'm saying? You trying to get some neck chops. That's it. But you got to get that game. Like, say when I be at work, I'm around females. Man, I love when females start talking to me about their relationship, good or bad. <laughs> I get so much. If it's bad, I it's, it's entertaining. Yeah. Right? But it's educational either way. Yeah, because like you know that they feel that much more secure around you. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. you, you're not trying to exploit the uh, relationship. You know what I'm saying? Right. Or the friendship. I got a girl. And then I come home. Man, you know how many times? I can't say this too loud. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know how many times I come home and I use some of their own shit on her? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I'm going to pick up a little game with one of the little girls at work. Get a tell about come right back and boom. <laughs> so, all right, man, I'm out, man. I got you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm. I'm all about information, man. If it's flowing, I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm ear hustling. Yeah, like I'm ear hustling. You you can't dismiss any of your uh, your opportunities. You know what I'm saying to make to take what you're interacting with and make yourself better. You know what I'm saying for who you with. You know. Right. That game is fat. It's just all about how you use it. And look, and you will never stop having game. No, it just evolved. It just evolved. It it just became. It becomes more man. applicable, man. Like because, like life should teach you, you know what I'm saying? It, through through passing interactions, that I gotta find ways to keep being better for my spouse. You know, right? Like, you gotta hit them with some shit. Don't yeah. walk in. Don't be the. Don't you can't. Don't walk in the house the same way every day. No, that shit trash. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm-mm. like, like you can extract from that whatever you want to. But like you and I, we talk like this all the time, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's. You can't get complacent. You know what I'm saying? As we approach 40, if we're not already 40 or mid-40s and some folks in their 30s, we can't be the same dude that we were 10 years ago. You know, like, don't buy one about the stagnant, you know what I'm saying, with themselves. But, but man, I don't want to be the dead horse on that. Bottom line is, man, like, yo, feel like your surroundings. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And if she look yes. like, if she look like she's trying to get out of your trap, you probably should leave her alone. Yeah, man. You wanna, you wanna. At the end of the conversation, you wanna make her not feel bad about having run into you wherever she ran into you. Yeah, you don't want to think like I should have stayed in the house today. I should have ordered that on Amazon. <laughs> right, because you could be the start of her bad day. Man, look, that's that's really key right there. That's really think key. about that. Think about that. They found y'all. How y'all say it? You step down on one. Yeah. <laughs> hey. 
you hey look we're gonna move on to uh, topic two we're gonna talk about whipping your kids isn't an effective isn't effective discipline uh markel brandon uh brought me that topic and um you know um uh, i don't know I, I i i um i can see why it is and i can see why it isn't you know um i feel like it wasn't important for me you know what i'm saying because i'm only going to use my personal experience you know what I'm saying? My parents whooped my ass, you know? Um, I know with you, yep. Yeah, but the thing... I was abused as a child, straight up. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, mama. <laughs> Sorry for cussing. Uh, Sorry for cussing. But, you know, like, I think I was one of those kids that was smart enough that I knew what I was doing, but, like, had my parents just told me I was disappointed and I couldn't trust you, that probably would have killed me. Mm-hmm. Bro, yo... Worse than the be. Yeah, like, like, worse than the be. You know what I'm saying? I would have probably asked for the beat. You know what I'm saying? Yes, like, yo, no, 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 no. Let me trade some of that disappointment in for the devil. Yeah. I, I can't work with this. I can't do that. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I don't know if that's like a level of Stockholm Syndrome or, or whatever, but like, I, I felt like I would have. Uh, Honestly, yeah. It, and, and the thing is, too, man, like, if my parent, if my, my dad and my mom had made me do push ups, and just hold the front knee and rest. I, I don't know how I feel right now. You know what I'm saying? Because my pops was into that shit. Like he used to like make you make us hold the wall. Mm-hmm. You talking about muscle failure, fam? You that that wall go? It's been there all day. Yeah, it ain't going nowhere. Your arms cannot hang with that wall. So that's on one side where we don't see it as being effective, right? Like, and so one of the comments from a man, George Vincent, what's happening, George? He said, uh, I think whipping is an easy easy solution. I absolutely agree with that. You know what I'm saying? Because Quick fix. Because like when your kids start already knowing, you know what I'm saying, what the next response is, like you did what at school? Get the belt. Get the belt. Get the strap. I think it should be more. Get the belt was the original like, get the strap too. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like <laughs> Yes. One hundred percent. You already know what time it is. Yes. I, I, and I think that's some type of mental torture, man. I shouldn't have to select my punishment. But like, don't make me go get the bill. You go get it. You go get it. Oh, and then this other part of it too, though. Like, I'm of the opinion that the two most effective institutions of uh, teaching are pain and embarrassment, and nothing does that like a whipping. You know. I am a firm believer in embarrassment. Yeah, like I don't, I don't dismiss the effectiveness of embarrassment. Some people get to the point where if they impacted by it, like you bullying. Like no 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 nah, no, no. like no, 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 no. you you can't respect nothing that can't kill you. Right. Like nobody calls uh, a lion cute Mm-mm. because it, because nobody says a tiger is cute. Nobody says the rhino is cute. You know why? Because all of them animals can kill you. You know what I'm saying? Right. But you will call a little ugly pug or a French bulldog or. Or, or, or a small tree frog, you call one of them cute. You don't call a snake cute, though. Mm-mm. Yeah. It's going get you out of here. But no. now, I do think this, that every... And this is the other part of it, too. So we, we've talked about the effective part, the ineffective part, possibly. You know, like, and it doesn't necessarily fit every kid, but hindsight is twenty twenty because, you know what I'm saying, like, we almost 40 now. So we look back and be like, you didn't need to do that to me, but you, they probably no. did. I don't they know what I did. Because I... I don't know what I did that week. I don't know what I said that week that I got away with, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And go back to, I don't know what you was on that day either when I did that. Straight up. Like, you might have had a bad day at work, and I'm the last person that should be disrespecting you after you get home. You know what I mean? And here I come with my bullshit. And here I come with my bullshit, right? But my man LJ just said, whoopings alone are not effective, but if things go too far, a whooping is needed. And, and yes, it should be part of a process. It should be part of a process, yep. You know, it should be step-by-step step almost, you know. Yes, um, like, it's it's cool to grind your kids. It's more effective to grind your kids. Man, see I'm going to go ahead and get on the ground side because all everybody kids that's on this thread right now got an iPhone, you got Wi-Fi running off to your house, it's iPads, you got all that stuff going on in your house right now for your kids. Stripping them down to the walls is more effective than beating their ass today. Bruh, I would take all of the cords at the house. Listen. Like no like I ain't got no ki- know, I ain't got no kids at the house that we gotta look after like that, but Fam. Mm-mm. Change that Wi Fi passcode, bro. Oh yeah. Like, like instant, instant results. Yeah. Hey man, look. 
you you gotta have a common. You gotta be creative. I think that's the bottom line. If, mm-hmm. That's what he. I think that's what he getting at by saying those weapons are ineffective. Yeah, you gotta find creative ways to to hurt their soul. Yeah, when they get out of line. Mm-hmm. Hurt they. I guess we need to hurt they, hurt their souls and not their body. Man, look, I, I think that's that's the best way to put it. You know, and uh, I, I you know like. I don't think it's much to to gain from you know saying that part. I think the the key point is that you got to be creative, and you got to embarrass them. But you got to embarrass them in a way in you know what I'm saying in your own within your own right. uh, home. You know what I'm saying. Don't do it publicly. But oh no, uh, but again, I got a great a great personal story about public embarrassment. Oh, go ahead, bro. Tell them about Yo, it. Yo, this is one of those times. And my my I always had issues in school. Like this is what all my troubles. Eighth grade, man. We had banks living. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Living. Grace was trash. One of the, you know what I'm saying? One cycle. Grace was trash. So this just happened to be the, you know what I'm saying? You know, you always had that time of year where we went shoe shop. It's time for new shoes, right? Mm-hmm. So I come through with the trash grade. Say a, say a couple of weeks before it's shoe time, right? Yeah. Like by the time it's horrible. Man, my like how my mom used to do like she used to, we used to go to the mall and she do whatever she do, but she would pay attention to the shoes that you know you you the shoe you pick it up you look at it you first thing you gonna do is turn it on the bottom to see if your mama gonna pay for it right right so she used to watch us do that and she would she was pretty good at it. like when you come home like whatever you was messing around with like if you had three pairs of shoes you pick up that day one of them gonna she she bought one of them for you right. Right. So I get home that day, made my brother go in the room. He's like, oh, my boy, like, it's shoe day. My brother hype, right? So he pulled some fresh Nike something. I think it was maybe some Air Rays, the one that had two straps. Okay. The front. Yeah. So like the nice, they was like some black history, but like the black with the African Oh, oh, he had the African on print on it? I started to order some the other day. Chilling them. Mm-hmm. I was like, ooh, fam, tell me why I get to my bag and it say Rydell. <laughs> <laughs> hey bro, you got the you got the shoes made by the folks that made helmets. Fam, my mama bought me cleats, bro. <laughs> 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 oh man, Auntie Iris, why you doing them like that? Oh cleats, bro. Cleats. I had and I have never Hold on, I got see. organized organized football a day in my life. I got to see if I can put uh, um let me see if I gotta get an evil laugh. You hear that? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay, it didn't work. My shit trash. But Yeah, man. <laughs> Please, bro. When I tell you I walked down the breezeway sounding like a substitute female teacher, man. Oh man. Like it sounded like I had on a pair of high heels, bro. Coming down the hallway. And I'm talking about I'm fresh to death. I got the stay flow Levi's killing the game. Right? Mm-hmm. This boy got on some black and white cleats. Like he is. Like this thing got he finna play on turf. Yeah. Like, what is happening? <laughs> what is happening? Bro. Yo, I run a whole six weeks, my boy. Six weeks in cleats? She took every other pair of shoe I had. That's probably why you pigeon told now. I say it didn't help. <laughs> I said that help. When I tell you, man, I wore them shoes for six weeks strong, but I made the honor roll the next six weeks too. Also, <laughs> I'm just saying, public humiliation goes a long. It way. It goes a long way. Sometimes, like yeah, sometimes it... you just gotta do it. <laughs> that boy, that boy, you just gotta do it. That boy wore some cleats for a whole report card period. Wow, it was ugly, man. I couldn't wait to get out of them cleats, man. <laughs> I don't even know what happened to them. I should have kept them. Yeah. <laughs> I should have kept them, man. I should have kept them, man. That's, oh, boy. Yeah, man, just like, my parents were creative like that. Yeah. Like, they beat our ass, too. But they used to come up with some wild shit. Mm-hmm. Wild shit. Man. Good times, man. Yeah, strangely enough, right? So, Good times. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to the uh, my third topic was gonna be the origin of the uh, Willie Lynch letter, but um, I'm gonna skip over that and I'm gonna move back to um, number four, which is black on black crime. Now, I think most of us is in this thread are pretty well read. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I got you know what I'm saying. Uh, uh, 
I think most people over here they, they care about stats and statistics. So out of respect, you know what I'm saying? I didn't go back digging up a whole lot of stuff, you know what I'm saying, to try to find this out. I think it's something that's always been known. People kill who they live around. People commit crimes against who they live around, you know? Like that's just the reality of it, you know. But with black on black crime, the reason why it's a myth is because you don't hear white on white crime, brown on brown, yellow on yellow, red on red. Pick what other ethnic, um, you know, like <clears throat> moniker that you can associate with it. Because black people ain't kill. You don't hear black on brown because black people don't live in brown communities. We right. And exactly. I'm not going across town to murk nobody. Yeah, like that's just not gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? So. That's a real quick myth that just iron out without having to get into, you know what I'm saying, numbers or whatever. Because from what I recall, white people kill each other around 83% of the time. Black people kill each other around like uh, 85% of the time. I think it's a comparable metric between the two. Um, uh, do we factor in cop murders into that equation? Uh, no, that's not in there. It's just solely like citizens. But like the other variable that you don't hear about is that um, a lot of the times that white people get charges dropped on them, you know what I'm saying, get modified when they commit crimes against people outside of their ethnic groups. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, they may go to trial, they got the money to fight the trial or whatever, whereas like a lot of poor black people, like my man Mike Mata has always uh, highlighted, is that a lot of times black people don't have the money to fight the case, so they have to uh, uh, cop to a lesser charge. So they wind up going to jail, so when those numbers hit the books, Based on the charges assessed, then the, then the statistics look different, you know. Right. So, yeah, and Mike just uh, highlighted. He said, "I believe it is close to ninety percent that crimes are committed against the same race." You know what I'm saying? And that makes pr- plenty of plenty that just sense. makes more sense. That's just logic. Yeah, like it's just gonna be like you know what I'm saying. And the numbers gonna be higher for white people because it's simply more white people. You know. Yeah, and then he said you can't get metrics on cop killings because they don't track them. Even the FBI can't track it. So how convenient. And, yeah, and, and Mike is is a um, you know what I'm saying a uh, a person that's working on um, his criminal justice uh, degrees. And okay. you know, I, oh, so he he immersed in the yeah law he right immersed now. in the law right now. You know what I'm saying? So my man with the shit too. You know so. Um, he keep killing Trump supporters in his timeline all day. They just keep making them. Yo, the, what, what we gonna done. get him on the phone? Bruh, it'd be nice. You know, like, matter of fact, hey, hey, Mike, you available? Come in if you're available. You know what I'm saying? I'll hit you up on three-way and let you talk. Because if not, I'm just gonna get on your nerves, bro, and I'm just gonna go ahead and call you anyway. You know? Yeah, man, because he dropping some gems in here. Yeah, like, hold up. Yeah, let me, let me get, I'm finna call him right now, all right? All right. Um, uh, just finished last week. Yeah. I'm, I'm finna, I'm finna interrupt him right now. I don't know why you think about that. Good call. Yo, Mike. Oh man, look at you out there talking like Michael Knight and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> night, night, night rider with the wrist and shit. You know what I'm saying? All right. All right. So, um, so right now we're talking about the myth on black on black crime, as you already saw. Um, what, 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 um, what specific statistics would you like to drop on us, or specific metrics that you want people to pay attention to that we might not be missing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I mean, so, so the biggest thing I said is like almost almost all crimes happen within the same racial groups. Like, like white people almost always commit crimes against white people. Black people almost always commit crimes against black people. Same thing for Hispanics. Like that's just like a normal thing, and and, and, and it's exactly for the same reason that you guys have already highlighted. It's, it's you commit crimes within close proximity to where you're at. Like, most people don't, like, if you're going to go rob somebody, you're not going to go drive two hours away to rob somebody. You're going to find somebody in close proximity. That's just how it is, you know? Um, All right. But, like, one of the one of the biggest things that blew my mind, um, study, studying, studying the whole criminal justice system, was the amount of people that, that plead out to crimes 
um, and, and go to not, not just like like misdemeanors and stuff like that. I'm talking about federal prison. Like some of the studies have shown like between six to eight percent, some even close to ten percent of the people that are in federal prison are there for crimes they didn't commit because they pled to a lesser punishment than they would have gotten if they went to trial and lost. And the overwhelming majority of the people that are that are part of those statistics are minorities because they're usually low income and they usually don't have the means to defend themselves. So they got a public defender who's like, hey, take this you know, three years because if we go to trial, you're probably going to get 15 to 20. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, if you, just, to, just to put this in perspective, like, you line up 10, 10 people, or, or say you line up 12 people from a federal prison, one of those people is in there for something they didn't do. That's too Like, that, 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 that's insane. That's yeah. like, the not, we're, we're not talking about one in a hundred or one in a thousand. We're talking about one in, like, 12 dudes. Hey. And think about how many millions of people are locked up right now. That's that's oh, crazy. Hey, so so Mike, with that with that statistic that you just brought up, you want to tell the people what your focus on, uh, what your focus is in your criminal justice studies. So so well so my my, my focus on in, in the in my in my field is criminal justice program has been in forensics, but like uh, initially when I started this whole thing, it was with the intent of like getting into like the FBI or DEA or some, some, some sort of federal law enforcement agency. But like the more that I've, I've learned over the last three, four years has gotten me to the point where I'm like, I need to go to law school and become a lawyer Mm -hmm. and start working for work, working, working, like doing public defense and things like that. Like, uh, like one of the, one of the, one of the things I did a lot of research on was the, uh, innocence project. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's, basically an organization that goes around and they take up cases where people have been convicted of crimes that they claim that they didn't commit. They go back and review the cases and uh, uh, the majority of the stuff is from like 20, 30, however many years ago before DNA became a thing, right? So like you go, if you go on their website, you'll see all this list of hundreds of cases where they've gotten guys that have been in prison for 25, 30 years for like some of the most heinous crimes you'll ever hear of. Like one of the guys was in prison for, for 27 years or something like that for raping and murdering his, his, his girlfriend's daughter. It was a black man, black girlfriend, black kid. He was in prison for almost 30 years for, for the rape and murder of this kid. They went back and checked the DNA. DNA didn't match him. It matched someone else. He got fully exonerated, but like, he was in prison for for damn near three decades for something he didn't do. And, that, and it's like it, like you can't even recover from that. Like imagine mm-hmm. imagine if you, if you if you get convicted of some, of something that hated, like your family has, has almost certainly disowned you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You ain't got no friends. You don't got no family. Everybody thinks you're a rapist and a murderer. And even mm-hmm. even if even if you are able to like reconcile with your family. They're not. They're. Ne- they're still never going to look at you the same way. You know. They're, they're, always, they're always. They're always. They're always going to be like. You know. Like. Oh. Uh, you know. We. We can't. We're not going to leave the kids around him alone because. Yeah. Like, even though he's innocent. Like for the last thirty, you can't take away thirty years of them. No. Believing that you did some stuff like that. Correct. It's yeah. just like, like, and it's stuff like that where it's just like, like, yeah. man, how, how the not- hell is this? Is this something that goes on? And then. And then, like a lot of the a lot of the stuff that that helps put these these guys behind bars is are these forensic sciences, which and like this is one of the things that's like almost even more scary is we we look at some of forensic sciences and it's it's not nearly as accurate as you would think it was. Like 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 uh, what's his name? John Oliver did a special on some some of forensic sciences where like they were where they used to do hair follicle analysis, right? Yeah. So they would. They would compare two two pieces of hair, and then be like, "Yo, this is this hair came from the same person, mm-hmm. right?" They did a re- they did a review of that stuff, and like they, they did like two hundred and twenty five cases, ninety four percent of them turned out to be wrong. Not ninety four percent to be not ninety four percent turned out to be right. 
94% turned out to be wrong. That, that makes my stomach of those, of, of those 94%, eight people had already been sentenced to death. You know that's about that. No, think about no think, think about that. <laughs> like, yeah, I got to like, pause for a second that's, on that. That's, that's, that, that's, that's just outrageous. That's a crazy and stuff. And I always align forensic science with pinpoint accuracy. Yeah, but 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 that's but that's part of that's part of the, the way the system is is that they they get these they they get these people that are are real smart and they they're they're confident in, in what they're saying so. Once it gets, once it gets like passes the initial kind of like sniff test, it becomes like a norm that like from now on we're gonna allow this type of stuff as evidence in court. And even even with the hair follicle analysis and stuff, like they they've disproven that obviously. Like, but it's still because it's already legal precedent, they can still attempt to use it in court, and a lot of times are able to. Mm-hmm. So. One of my one of my guys says of the based on the ninety percent fact that you you know what I'm saying that you presented the statistic rather he said are the other ten percent what's the other ten percent comprised of is it hate crimes of the are you, you mean the like the cross racial like yeah yeah that, yeah that was mm-hmm. to? yeah uh, I I don't know that they would be classified as as, as hate crimes but it's just kind of like. Uh, most most crimes that are that are that are committed aren't aren't pre planned kind of kind of it just kind of happenstance like, and it, overreactions it, and stuff like it, that. It's, it's, it, 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 yeah, it's, uh, overreactions or just a crime of opportunity. Like you're passing by, you see a car that's that's unlocked, and then you, you break in and you steal some shit. Um, same thing, like you know, you may go 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 knock on a door, you notice nobody's home. Then you're like, okay, they got. Looks like they got some nice stuff in here. And then you break in. That kind of deal. Um, okay. I, 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 I honestly don't have the statistics on on like hate crimes right off the top of my head, so mm-hmm. I would have to look into it. Yeah, I, I would say that if if I had to take a stab at it, you know what I'm saying, just on, um, you know, like the eye test, rather, you know, like what we see in the media and what we are are able to, you know, what I'm saying, associate with. I would say we've probably gotten to the point now where most of the hate crimes are committed uh, committed against maybe the trans and gay community. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think I'd be wrong. Yeah, it's definitely. I, 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 yeah, definitely. They're definitely up, up 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 towards the top for sure. Yeah, at this point, and then that, that, that's not this. And yeah. we got to make sure we, uh, uh, you know, what I'm saying qualify that. That's not to say that hate crimes don't happen. We're yeah. just saying that what's being reported. Is is vastly different from what's actually taking place, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anybody disagree um, with that? Yeah, like, I mean, because I don't want to make sure. I, I want to make sure I don't just put something in concrete. I'm just saying the eye test, you know, and that's just basically what I see. And somebody else's eye test may be different. I mean, I see the killings of uh, people from the LBGT uh, community quite often. You know what I'm saying in my timeline because you know the different types of news sources that I get. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, in my timeline, you know, and I'm I'm always trying to see new information and stuff like that, and make sure I understand that you know people that don't live the same life as I um, really do have some difficulties, you know, based on what it takes for them to exist every day. Right. Yeah. No. That, that, that's absolutely right. Because and one of the other things is it's kind of like you know there there's being in the LGBT community has become more acceptable but it's still not you know there's there's still a, a large part of the population that that is not supportive you know what i mean so it's a lot it's it's, it's that it makes it that much more difficult for for victims of those types of crimes to come forward because they they still don't feel as though they're they're part of the community and that's that's kind of one of the one of the reasons why people don't don't report those types of crimes okay so you mentioned uh you know, people getting convictions overturned based on new, new, newly presented information, right? Um, yeah. What's usually the rate of dispatch for that person to be made free again after the information has so, so been validated? It, 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 so, it, so what's what's wild about this is it's different in every state, right? Um, so some states, 
states, you can, you can get paid, right? Um, other states, they'll say, you know, however many years you were locked away, and we'll give you the average amount of the income of a person in that state over the, we'll give you like 50% of the average annual income of, the, of, of what the average person in the state makes. So like, so that typically is somewhere around $30,000, $40,000 for the average. So you get half of that. So like, so you get a lot of for, for 10 years. You can't even get the whole 30? And we're talking about like a hundred thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Like you can't even get the whole thing. Yeah, you just spend it fast. Yeah, the yeah. whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I get locked up. It's different. Well, I'm just, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yep. And, and 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 on top of that, there's stipulations in how you have to go about getting it. So like, there's all these loopholes you have to go through, and if you don't if you don't do it the right way, or you don't do it within a certain amount of time, the state doesn't have. Wow, so you so still... There, there's a potential for you to get, get locked up for 15, 20 years, however many years, and then you don't end up with, with anything other than like, hey man, our bad. Wait a minute, so I get so I get locked up unjustly, and I still got to do the paperwork right, even though... <laughs> even though... Bro, that's crazy, you know what I'm saying? That's something I'm, to think I'm, about. I'm, t- I'm telling you, man. That's, like, that's, that's one of the things where like, you know, I, I, I went into this thing thinking it was going to turn out one way and the, it was like the more I read the more I learned and the more more papers I wrote I was just like man I cannot believe how it, how this stuff works hey, you know um, I actually just got done listening to a podcast it's called a serial podcast um, season three is, uh, is, is is applicable to like criminal justice so essentially this lady and a couple of her people that she was working for her sit through like the Baltimore court systems for like like a year, two years, some, some like extended amount of time where they just sat through and just like watched court cases and interviewed people that were involved in all this stuff. Um, and she goes through and she's, she's and, and, and kind of breaks down all these different cases and how they turned out, how, how the judges operated and stuff. And it was just like, it was just mind blowing. Um, actually it was in Cleveland, I'm sorry, Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it was just mind blowing how like, like, like how these cases were turning out and how, how the 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 court system basically facilitates. Like once you get in it, it's almost you know you're you're almost destined to stay in it just yeah. because of the way the, the way that they treat you when you're when you're in it. And then once you get out, all the things you have going against you only leads you to get back into it. Man, so have you ever read uh, Michelle Alexander's uh, The New Jim Crow? I, I have not read that. No. Man, look, I, I think it would be a very good research tool for you. Now, I think the book was uh, published in 2008, if I'm not mistaken. But, like, the vast amount of information for recidivism that she offers in there and, for, and, and uh, also giving historical context in terms of how the police have culturally always seen black people and how the police have always culturally seen themselves, you know what I'm saying, um, it, during the reconstruct, post-reconstruction period and, you know, during the populist movement uh, since the inception of uh, African slavery, you know, with putting indentured servants to the side and stuff. She gives a good mix and assessment and analysis intertwined between all those different topics, you know, that pretty much bring to life what is the things that you're talking about right now. Um, I, th- I encourage people to read that book if... You're confused about the criminal justice system and don't understand exactly what odds are stacked against you based on the chances that you take and your level of being able to recover once you've been subjected to those circumstances and the consequences uh, in America as a black person, then I encourage you to read this book. You know, it's called Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. Um, And it's, uh, the mass, it's about mass incarceration, bottom line, you know. And man, like, um, man, since uh, I got you on here, I'm gonna get ready to move to another topic in a minute, though. You know, um, I don't know if I want to talk about, like, I'm not necessarily going in a specific order. I got the docket up there about the topics and stuff, right? But since I got you on here, what you want to talk about, man? Because I, I'd rather let you go ahead and vent, man, because you're a troll. You know what I'm saying? You, you're a real life troll. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're my partner. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be sick of you. So, um, like, 
if you can see the docket, I think I know what you want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? But I'm I'm a, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you choose, uh, and you go from here. Yeah. So so so, so, so today I don't know if you saw some of the threads, but um, I had some extensive arguing with an individual who's who seems to be an, an apologist for for Trump supporters, or as I like to define them, racist like racist white people. Um, <laughs> hey, um, but, hey, y'all keep, hey, y'all keep but, talking. I'm but, going to the bathroom. One of the questions I posed on my Facebook today was like, you know, why is it that we don't ever see groups of, you know, white males wearing red hats? Why are they never in confrontation with other groups of white? Why is it always with groups of, of, of Hispanics or black people or um, other other minorities. There's never there's never you don't ever see videos of like what white people wearing MAGA hats going at it with other white people. You know what I'm saying? And like for that to be just a coincidence to me, like that's just that's just, it's not realistic. You know, um, this guy you know the, the guy that I was arguing with is always always trying to say that there's some color like there's some media narrative where they're trying to, you know, make it out to where all these people wearing red hats are always racist. Well, like, like, look, man, how come, how come it always, like, you know, may, maybe they're not, not every single one of them is a racist. Maybe. But why does it always seem to turn out that way? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like, how, how is it that, that all these incidents always happen with people of color and never with Caucasians versus Caucasians. Smoke and fire. <laughs> hey, that's why. Like, smoke and fire, man. That, that's like what. That's like that's why my that's my guy. Now some somebody out there is gonna like. I saw the post. I know the conversation, but I saw um, you know people already trying to deflect, and we ain't finna do that over here. You know what I'm saying? I'm not even finna introduce a different vari- uh, a variable. I'm not trying to hear no counter narrative. You know what I'm saying? Those folks are what they are and who they are. Um, but with that being said, with all of the the metrics that you presented, and regardless of whatever language they choose to accept to describe their behavior, one thing is for certain, their, their boundaries have been defined. You know what I'm saying? So we just need to adjust. We can't worry about folks that don't give a shit about us. Period. Period. Like, I don't care what they're about. It's just that simple. Like, I don't care what they're about. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, um, I, I think that we're at a stage now, like, the policies match the rhetoric. Absolutely. <laughs> like, it's like you, you can't, like, you, you can't be an objective person and, and look at what comes out of the administration and what comes out of the of the hardcore support. I'm not talking about like people that just like, okay, I voted for Trump because I'm Republican, I want to repeal Roe v. Wade or, you know, some obscure nonsense like that. I'm talking about like you wear red hats and you go to rallies. Like like those if you if you wear if you go to a rally and you wear a red hat, there's about a one hundred percent chance that you're going yeah, yeah, just like, about a hundred percent chance. There is no, there is no middle ground in there. You no. know what I'm saying? Like, there's like, like, like you might be able to find a, a handful, of, a handful of people that are Republican that are like, look, I just couldn't, I couldn't vote for Hillary because yep. of X, Y, and yeah. uh, and you know what? I, I, I got that. Yeah. Um, you can respect. I, I feel, there's I a scale. Agree with it. That, yeah. I still disagree with it. There's a scale. But, and at the same time, I'm, I'm talking about like if you are a, a, a true MAGA. Yeah. Like you are you are you're a racist person. Like that's just how it is. Th- th- yeah, that's your banner. You know what I'm saying? And you should never want to fall on that side of it. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be prepared to defend that level of it anyway. You know what I'm saying? So but but the, the myth is is that they're not who you just said they are. That's the myth. You know what I'm saying? They they they, they, per- they portray themselves to not be that, you know. And we know that to that doesn't the way they feel doesn't match the policy. And if you align with the policy, yeah, and, 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 and you, you can you can look at the policy and, and, and just 
tell that it's it's all based on ignorance because because like 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 his late one of his latest tweets was like this build the wall and crime will fall well statistically illegal immigrants illegal immigrants and legal immigrants bring down crime rates per capita in whatever location that they relocate to right right because 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 of, because of a couple factors number one is more often than not, illegal immigrants, when they commit crimes, it's almost always, like we were talking about earlier, it's almost always against illegal immigrants, yeah. right? So that, right. So, that, so that reduces the probability of a crime committed to another person outside of that, right? Yeah. But overall, illegal immigrants commit less crime and less violent crime than all other demographics. Yeah, well, because the overwhelming majority... In particular, white people... For, Yes, and, and, and particularly white people. Yeah, so so it, it, it's kind of one of those deals where like um, the way the way I try to put it is like you know you could be on on a bus with like ten people and one of you is going to get murdered, but you're all American citizens, right? Mm-hmm. Or you could be on a bus with fifty people and two of you are going to get murdered, but there's ten illegal immigrants. Which which bus do you want to be on? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. right. Like, it's, right. It's, it's simple. It's simple mathematics. You know. And that's one of the things where, like, where people try to, you know, misuse statistics and all that stuff. Like, I just had some guy the other day try to try to tell me about how, you know, the the immigration had arrested like like two thousand people, uh, two thousand illegal immigrants that were that had committed a murder. And I was like, I was like, I was like, look at look at the actual study that was that was pulling these statistics. Number one, you lost them as study. They were showing, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like number yeah. one, it was they they. They would. They were counting uh, the number of charges per crime towards that statistic. So, like, say one person kills one uh, one person, but then gets four separate charges associated with that same crime. Right. So, so they it's were inflated. counting it as four instead of, instead of one. Inflated. You know what I mean? And not only that, but they wasn't all from that same year. It was spread out over decades. You know what I'm saying? So, so they try to make it seem like. Like wow, holy shit! Like illegal immigrants killed over, murdered over a thousand people last year. I was like, well, that's not even close to the truth. Yeah, fear mongering, fear mongering. Yeah, but yeah. uh, man, look, Mike, I appreciate you being available. Um, and just so everybody listening, I'm not interested in hearing no no pro no pro Trump opinions. Okay, like you go to your Fox News. Oh, we cool. Yeah. Yeah, you go yeah. find whatever we talking our shit over here. I don't give a damn about yeah, what you got to say as a counterpoint. Mm-hmm. I see a couple of folks in and there I, that want to defend it. I see it. I see it. You know what I'm saying? But like, that's not what we're doing over here. You know what I'm saying? We see you. Yeah, you you go live and talk your shit on your page. This ain't what we're doing at that. All right. So and I'll be sure not to log in. So yeah. that's how we gonna keep it. Because it ain't gonna change shit. You, you ain't no ain't nothing that you mm-hmm. can say that's gonna make me say, oh, I see their point no. of view. Man, fuck everything no, y'all you talking about. No fuck it's everything strange, y'all talking about over there. You know what I'm saying? We good over here. So, um, I'm in line with people that, that that think the same. Y'all y'all rock y'all Fox News. We gonna keep supporting each other over here. Get your little red hats. Yeah, yeah. Run to your little uh, KKK rally. You know what I'm saying? And and, and feel comfortable. Hey, yeah, yeah, see, I, I hope y'all feel very comfy, man. But somebody, somebody gonna get washed yeah. behind the hat. Full rinse, full rinse on deck. You know somebody what I'm saying? Somebody gonna get washed behind the hat. <laughs> yeah, like, like straight up. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but hey, Mike, I ain't gonna hold you up too much, man. I know you passed your curfew and shit. And your dispatch about to run out. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. I'm actually, uh, I'm in Maryland right now, doing, uh, doing some work. So I'm, I'm not at home during the, during, uh, during the week. What? All so, right. Uh, I I got I, actually I, I, before 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 we switch topics I have one more thing to say I forgot to uh, okay I got sidetracked with the conversation and whatnot one one more thing in association to, to black on black crime like one so one of the, the big like especially and this was one of big uh, Trump's big talking points was talking about the violence in Chicago and all this and that how all these you know black people are killing black people in Chicago and this and that one of the biggest misconceptions about Chicago and violence is that. Chicago is not even in the top ten for most violent cities in America, right? Mm-hmm. They, 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 so what they do is they point out the numbers, like, oh, there is this many murders in Chicago. Well, we look at population densities. Like Chicago is the 
the second or third most densely populated city in America. So, so obviously there's going to have, you're going to be more crimes, right? Yeah. So I want to say Chicago has been like 12th or 13th the last several years in crime in murders per capita, which means basically when you look at murder statistics, you should be looking at how many murders occur per a certain number of populations of the population. And typically that's a hundred thousand, right? Right. So, if you look at it in that metric, you know, there's 13 other cities that have more murders per 100,000 people than Chicago. I've said the same thing. Always, oh, I'll look at all these, look at all these people, you know, all these black people killing each other in Chicago. And it's like, well, hold on a second. Like, what about these 13 other cities where, where more people are getting killed per 100,000 people in the population? Yeah. And it's, it's just one of it's one of those ways where, where people take statistics and they, they 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 give you an accurate stat, but they give it to you in such a way that it, it distorts the accuracy. Yeah, it, you know, it, yeah, it's, we're, a, we're it's about getting all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they turn the bandwidth down on the information and the facts, bro. I, we we get it. You know? So, but what the reality is is that no matter how kind of no, no matter how many different ways of packaging that they present the information to us, you know, like we still have the ultimate decision about how we engage with people that differ in social and political opinion, right? And and all of that to me just comes back to fuck all of them. You know what I'm saying? Like if they ain't got my interest in mind, I don't have no reason to talk to them. You know what I'm saying? And, I ain't got that kind of time. And, but... and, and I don't. I don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, and some people going to say, somebody used the word tribalism. Yeah, I agree with that. You know what I'm saying? We should be more tribal. Mm-hmm. You know yes, what I'm saying? Yes, like, I like, seen him. I seen him. He, he, he been going right on down the time. Yeah. I'm like, yep, we need yeah. to do that. Yep, we need to do that. Yeah. That means that. Yeah, we got to get some of that. But this is the thing, yeah, though. Because, because, the, the, because the, the, and the, and the reason why is because you can't, you can't count, count on the majority which is Caucasians to 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 help you empathize. You know, like, they like, they they cannot like, empathize with some, with a life that they don't live. They they, they cannot they, white white people more than anything. And, and I, I, I'm speaking in generalities because there are you know there are there are, there are good white folks out there, but but white people as a whole are generally less empathetic than than almost every other race you look at. Yeah, history tells that story. It, it, it's one of those things where, like, if it doesn't happen in their life, that means it's not an issue Bruh, that, that everyone else looks yeah, Absolutely true. You know what I'm saying? And, and like, history tells that story. You know what I'm saying? Like, and on every continent, <laughs> like, you ain't never read a, 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 a story about black people jumping on ships and voyaging across the Atlantic to go kill a whole bunch of white folks. <laughs> you can't find it. You ain't never read a story about black people going to white communities and lynching white folks. Never. Never. You know what I'm saying? So we can't get that Frank Gate. <laughs> we don't know the code. You know? So so with with that being said, man, hey Mike, I ain't gonna hold you up. Don't get ready to move on to the next topic, man. I appreciate you making Making yourself available. Um, and hey, like talking to you, Mr. Mike, sir. Congratulations on your your, your recent accomplishment as well. Yeah, pre- appreciate it, man. And uh, anytime, man. You know, yeah. Especially, especially you know, especially when it comes to uh, criminal justice. Hey, man. I, I can talk that. I think I'm gonna make you my legal advisor, bro. I'm a, I'm a. Uh, <laughs> I'm dead serious. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I appreciate that. Right. Me, me, and, me and Mike got a similar background. You know what I'm saying? Before he parted and, and went the route of criminal justice, so we got uh, a lot of common ground on how we see things, and and it translates fluidly. You know what I'm saying? For what he does for a living, man. And I appreciate his uh his contribution, man. But Mike, I'm gonna holler at you, bro. All right, man. Yep. I'll be listening. All right. Later. Drew, you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, man. Hey, that was uh, I'm I'm glad I got people like Mike in my corner, bro. You know what I'm saying? Oh man, that was he's a, so full of love. Yeah, all day. You know, like he's a premier troll, though. You know what I'm saying? But like, you never know it. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like um, uh, 
he he been as long as I known him, he always been, you know what I'm saying, he been the tip of the spear on a lot of the conversations where, you know what I'm saying, he's targeting the uh, the, the red hat militia, you know what I'm saying, and putting them in a place. But like of course, they don't care about facts. They care about what benefits them, you know. And I mean and, and we need to be just like them in that regard. Yes. In principle. You That's know? why I don't understand why they always trying to book that. We like, like it like, doesn't have to be this. It don't y'all made it that way. Yeah. Like we didn't create race. So don't come telling me right, don't come we, telling we, me what it ain't gotta be. We we know that already. Don't don't talk to us about what you created. We're just reacting. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So uh So that was oh it that doesn't have to be gender specific. What's out of here? Man, look, so my next topic, I'm gonna try to hit my boy Chad up. So he could talk about the uh, myths of the Willie Lynch letter. You know what I'm saying? So I think that'd be pretty interesting. Hang on, bro. Oh, Chad. Hey, Chad, what's happening, bro? What's going on, bro? How you doing, man? Man, pretty good. You got a few minutes, man. I got you on live. Yeah, yeah, man. I uh, I, I, I just got, uh, got, got a little bit of free time, too. So it's probably okay. a good time, man. Stand by. Hey, Drew, Chad, what's happening? What's going on? Yo, yo. Hey, uh, hey so uh, Chad, Drew, like, uh, you know, this this is uh, an impromptu phone uh uh, I guess engagement with you guys, but like all of us from the same city, um, it ain't a doubt in my mind that if we all sat down and you know what I'm saying and opened a beer, we talk for hours. You know what I'm saying? Like Chad, like blood to me. Like I can leave you around him, and you you think I'll still be there? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I ain't. But the the funny part about me meeting Chad was that I never I didn't know I met him in Afghanistan. And we know all the same people in Birmingham. Like, but if I went to Birmingham... So y'all didn't know each other in Birmingham? Didn't know each, other, didn't in know each other in Birmingham. Nope. We met each oh, other. Wow. We, Yo, I was working in Afghanistan. He got hired, and he came on, and we got to chopping it up. He said he went to Alabama University, and then it, it just trickled for that. When he said he was from Birmingham, I already knew it was a chance that we knew a lot of the same people. But, you know what I'm saying? That's how close it is. You so know? Did, did y'all hug? <laughs> I had my tray in my hand, bro. I had my tray in my hand. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I, I can respect that. Yeah. And he live weights. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, yeah. all of us on well, the yeah. same shit. That would have been awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, but Chad hit me with a a great myth to sit down and discuss right now. Hey, what's that background noise, man? Somebody standing in front of ESPN or something? What is that? Yeah, that's me. Let me put this thing on mute. Yeah, man. Yeah, mute that thing, bro. I ain't talking about that. So, so, so Chad brought us the myth, uh, the myths associated with the Willie Lynch letter. You know, I wish I could have my docket. You know, what I'm saying showing right now, other than what's up in the caption. But like, I'm gonna let Chad take it from here, though. And by the way, Chad is, you know, uh, he got his own podcast called the Kind of Sleepy Podcast. Hey, Chad, wait, before you get off, bro. Make sure you leave a link to your podcast in this thing, too. So, I'm sorry. I'm walking back with my car. I'm, uh, let me, okay. Let me get the car right quick. Oh, but, hey, um, so, the, the Willie Lynch letter, um, it's an it's a, it's a issue to me. Um, it's a huge issue in our community. And we latched on to this uh, letter, and I understand why we did it. You know, my father gave me the letter when I was, I believe, 12 years old. And it was in a it was in an attempt to get me to understand some of the things that were happening to me while I was going to um, W J Christian, which is a school you know in Birmingham. Right. Um, right. So my dad also gave me the book by Dr. Jawanza Kunjufu, which is called Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. So that's the context in which I received the letter. So it was it was just explaining to me exactly what I was going through as a young black male in a um, educational system that was not made for me to succeed and having teachers who didn't always understand exactly what it was I was experiencing growing up in the neighborhood I was growing up in. Mm -hmm. 
So I read the letter and it made so much sense to me. And it makes a lot of sense to us because we do experience colorism within our community on a very great level. We experience ageism in our community on a very great level. Yep. We experience classism on a very great level in our community. I mean, you need to look no further than uh, some of the black folks that went to college and those that didn't. And then there's a separation amongst them. Some of the folks that went to PWIs, look at those that went to HBCUs in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And then even within the realm of HBCUs, those that went to like, you know, some of the more prestigious HBCUs, look at some of those that went to the less prestigious HBCUs. So there's a lot of isms that go on within our community that a lot of times we don't like to talk about. So mm-hmm. I understand why we latched on to it. And so I wanted to do more research about it. And I started doing research and realized that the whole thing was created by a black man in the 70s. And immediately, I felt like at the age of 22, that, that was like, that's like finding out Santa Claus ain't real. Okay. So, so let me pause that for a second. Let me pause that. My man Chad just said that the Willie Lynch letter was written in the 70s. Let that, let that marinate for a minute. Go ahead, Chad. So it was written by a guy, I believe it was in Baltimore. I'm, 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 I'm going to remember his name. But it was written initially as a serious but yet satirical piece to get us to understand exactly what was going on in our community in terms of the separation that we were feeling intra-racially, not interracially, which means a different race, of course, understand this for the people who are listening, but but within our own race, intra-racially. And so I started thinking, I was like, well, if this is an observation he's making, why is it that we have to be, why is it that the authenticity of it has to be linked to a white man for us to even believe it or acknowledge it? Mm-hmm. And to take it so seriously. That's what hurt me the most about the whole thing. Like me, young, 22, 21-year-old dad, as a black man, sees these things. I didn't need a false letter, a letter created by us to trick me into seeing these things. Well, I started thinking about the greater community and why we immediately latched on to it and why even to this day, people will try to use it as a trump card when, they talk, when you're talking about things that go on in our community, not knowing that really, that's like me saying, oh man, I think we should give to the poor. And the reason I believe we should give to the poor because Santa Claus to everybody. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Right. So that's like, so to, to put that in context, hey, we have a problem with, you know, discriminating against ourselves and our community. And the reason I see it is because a white man told me we do it. Even though the white man is, you know, absolutely, positively invisible and imaginary, imaginary but I believe it because this imaginary white man said so. Because uh... that leads to an even deeper problem that we have within ourselves and the authenticity we automatically grant white people when they say something versus things that we say. Yeah, I agree with that too, man. And so I, I've been saying that we have been living lives that have always been linked to the approval of white people in order to be valid. Like, don't name your child that because ain't no white person gonna hire them. You know what I'm saying? Shit like that. Absolutely. That's why I cut my dreads. I cut my dreads because I got tired of going on interviews in Alabama and and being very, very well qualified, but for some reason not receiving the job because I knew as I walked out of the door, I didn't look the part. I'll tell you a story. I went to a job interview once, and there was two black guys. It was two of us, two black people in the room, and we were all waiting for the same interview. And they said my name, and, I, and of course, I don't have a quote-unquote traditionally black name. My name's Chad. Yeah, you part of the I'm wild Chad. Right. 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 Right, I stood up, and the young and the and the older lady said, "Oh no, no, I said Chad Jamal." Oh my goodness! And I looked at the other black dude in the room. What? I was like, what? I was, and he looked at me. I looked at him, and I was like, "What? Wait, what?" And I said, "You know what? You've been very helpful in helping me make my decision. Thank you." And I walked out. Like that's all I could wow. say because I wow. really wanted to go off. <laughs> but, Bruh. Man, I'm going to jail. I can't even process that. Yeah, Jamal, that was all I knew. That was all I knew. Yeah, 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 that was all I knew. Yeah
Hey, Chad, can you turn down uh, your, your radio? We get a lot of feedback. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you good. So, um, basically, the Willie Lynch letter created a false sense of security associated with being a second-class citizen, pretty much. <laughs> like, like for real, like, like the Willie Lynch letter was written, and I embr and I looked at it like, and I could see how people embrace it as though, like, we have to marry our struggle, and I'm not okay with that. I think some things have to exist in a certain era, and we have to learn from it and move on. You know what I'm saying? Like, you use it as a reference point. Right. There, there was a poet named Sheehan that one said, "Um, the struggle is the I don't understand why everybody's embracing the hood when it is a situation we should be trying to get out of. I can see that. Yeah, that logic too. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see it. But I also understand that poverty is cyclical. But that's not just a, a matter of money. And I learned that when I was teaching in Jefferson County Schools. I learned that poverty is just as much a state of finances as it is a mentality. Man, look, it's a state of thinking. Like... <laughs> I, I wrote it, I, man, look, I wrote that in my book. Again, the book is called The Code. You know what I'm saying? Y'all can find it on Amazon. But I I wrote about um, intellectual poverty. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you know better, but you opt not to do better, and then shame those that want to do better, you know, like, you know, you know that that's not the route. But because you have a state of fear and insecurity, that you're going to be surpassed, you know what I'm saying, by your hopes and dreams are going to be realized by somebody else that's sitting next to you. Nobody wants to take that responsibility. The hood is not your environment. It's the state of mind that you're in. Because, like, if everybody changes what they do that, quote, unquote, lives in the hood or the less desirable parts of town and starts, you know, be, be, uh, being a, uh, uh, a community that's centered around prosperity and doing things that, you know, like that lead to prosperity. What can you call it? Because it's not the hood that everybody else wanted to be anymore, right? Because, like, that's why, like, in, in my periods of enlightenment, I'm I'm keen upon not condemning the person more than I condemn their actions. Because if they stop doing the things that that are negative, you know, what what you gonna judge them by? If you stop what you're doing, can't nobody do nothing but bring up your past. But if you don't uh, uh, honor their assessments by trying to go back to the old you, and you keep be becoming progressive and stuff, nobody can really box you in, right? Absolutely. Because none of us here are um, the products of what we did when we was in our 20s and kept doing, right? We learned a lesson in that era and learned we wasn't bulletproof. Learn that you couldn't have no leverage as a painter's apprentice. You know what I'm saying? You you learn. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? We created different avenues and stuff. You know what I'm saying? So our behavior changed and our environments changed because of our behavior. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship. Where you are does have an effect on how you think. And everybody's a product of their environment, whether positive or negative. But people forget that in math, if you multiply times a negative, it's a negative too. You know what I'm saying? But right. <laughs> but that don't mean you can't get a positive out of it because what's a negative times a negative? Positive. All right then. So yeah. like we can't on one hand say whether well, smoke this fire or that for every action as a reaction or you know in, in in any one of those cliche terms and then throw it out the window just because of where our feet are. You know what I'm saying? Those are just our cards that we've been given. And our cars are different than everybody else's. And we don't have to make, we don't have to spend our time making white people understand the circumstance that we came from. Because they'll never get it anyway. You know? So what we need to do is just reinforce those things that are going right. We got enough negative. We got a history of that. That we that, that wasn't from our own undoing. You know, our own undoing, rather. You know? Because we, we've never had anything to undo. We have only had circumstances to work on through. And they're unique to us. We don't know we don't owe anybody an explanation. So, black people, if you're listening, stop.
stop trying to explain to white folks, you know what I'm saying, what your circumstances are. Because at the end of the conversation, the motherfucker still don't have to live your life. Right. They ain't gonna never understand your story, no matter how well written it is. You know what I'm saying? So now, th- those people that we know that uh, that that have an idea that can empathize, we need to protect those people. You know what I'm saying? Especially they're doing the things and they have redeeming qualities. You know what I'm saying? But outside of that, don't get wrapped up in a wilderness letter. It's a myth. You know what I'm saying? And it's written by somebody that uh, Chad has yet to name. You know, but I trust his judgment. And, I, and he gonna come back with that fact. And I saw it too. I saw you post a link before. But I understand names escape us and so much information flying all, all over the place. Um, that, you know, it may not be present right now. But I'm gonna make, make sure I repost that. And then, you know what I'm saying, give a synopsis that captures what we're talking about right now. That way people can have it as a reference point. And I'm gonna make sure to get people to try to bookmark it too. So just in case, um, you know, some misinformation is being spread as fact. We got to come back to that. I had another myth that I was going to add in there for later, but it's the myth that Elvis Presley was a racist. Mm. Ooh. I wouldn't doubt that. No, no, but but how Elvis killed, Elvis Presley became a racist is some crazy. You know what I'm saying? I read that not too long ago, and I'm definitely going to have that on the next uh, set of myths. Not today, though, but I felt like that was a good time to plug that in. <laughs> I don't and 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 not that Elvis has had an impact on our community because that was the topic of it, but I felt like it was an honorable mention. Right. Yeah, well, that's definitely yeah. an honorable mention. Yes. So, hey man, uh, most of my heroes don't appear on those stamps. No, not at all. Hey, so Chad, why I got you on the phone? Oh, I, I got it. I got his name. I got his name. His name cool. is Doctor Quavina uh, Ashanti, and he's actually from Durham, North Carolina. <laughs> that name, I've heard that name somewhere before. Probably associated with. I don't know myth. if it in reference with that, yeah, but that name sounds to me. Appreciate that, Chad. He, I think he, he wrote a book, I believe, called "The Psychotechnology of Brainwashing." Okay, so what? What? Think about the irony in that, right? Think about how many people he brainwashed with the Willie Lynch letter. Right, I was just going to say, did he write the brainwashing book before or after he did the the, the Willie Lynch letter? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. He wrote he wrote the the letter in 1970, and then I believe he wrote the book. I want to say in like '93, maybe. Yeah, twenty. Shit, the book might have just been the end. Yeah, the yeah. end of his experiment. I yeah. see how my experiment turned out. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Makes I'm gonna give it. Me. Yeah, I'm gonna give it 20 years to to marinate, and then I'm gonna hit him with this yeah. right here. You know. How much? And I'm gonna check back in on y'all. Yeah. Yep. I'm about to hit you. you with, for us. I'm about to hit you with the war. That's psyops. Yeah, straight up, straight <laughs> psyops. <laughs> He, my man, my man hit him with the the literary water whip on him. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So we doing it to ourselves. That's hard, man. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, as as somebody who works in the communication space, um, and who's like in my in my current profession, um, is I, I am in the business of uh, communicating people and to and, and in the business of properly relaying and effectively relaying and influencing. Messages. Um, and influencing, you know, how you view something. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. And seeing how this letter permeated our community in such a deep way that it's been mentioned not only in some of our favorite movies like The Great Debaters, but also been the foundation of some of the books that we've written and read and some of the things that have shaped our entire thought process and worldview. I got to say... From a from a purely professional standpoint, it was a great. It was effective as hell. It was effective, yeah. Like, but at the same time, I think about the detriment that it has done to us by giving us a false reality. Yeah, because if you go out, but ahead, I wonder where it got lost in because some like in the beginning of this letter being circulated, right? Somebody had to know that he wrote it for a specific purpose. Mm. So where did where did the purpose get lost? Probably didn't find it until the next book when he, you know, what I'm saying it's about brainwashing. Right, like all bla- he, hey. I don't know if that was intentional or, or what, but well, this I is, believe it was intentional. Yeah, I mean because it stated he kind of stated that it was his way of explaining the theory of separation amongst our community. Right, but did he? Did anybody else know that 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 was the purpose he was he was using it for? Because 
we shouldn't have been able to take it in as law if we knew he was trying to serve that particular purpose. Well, just to show us what we're doing. But somewhere in the line, we took it as some white guy said this and made us do it, not somebody showing right. us what we're doing. Right. It's it's, it's not just well. Let, let, let's take let's take this one step further to religion. Almost. Go ahead. I bro. mean, if we read the Bible, that's why I call Bible, Chad, bro. That's why I call Chad. Go and, ahead, and we, man. And we focus on Christ and who Christ was and who he says he is and how he used parables to explain things to us, right? And we take those things as gospel very, very literally, and we often miss the very meaning of the entire message. Exactly. You know? we were more fo- yeah, we were more focused on making the story law as a way you were trying to show us more. Yeah. Buy- exactly. We buy... Can't we see buy the facts for the, the details. Right. We buy the ideology yep. without buying the context. Yeah, that's that's what it is. What? Man, that's what a lot of people in religious, like all of that stuff, was maybe just a template. Yep. Like it it was. It was. I I look at it like this. It it was just an attempt at structure. You know what I'm saying? You needed to have something to motivate people, and uh, so they can hold themselves accountable because it's all about decentralized leadership, right? You read a doctrine, me and me, you and Chad interpret it differently, but we got different approaches to the same goal. You know what I'm saying? And it's all centered on trying to hold ourselves accountable. That may be one variable of it. And then the other end of it is that some people write stuff just to exploit folks. And that's always been the case. You know what I'm saying? Because we live in a capitalistic structure. You know what I'm saying? There's there's right. never any there's never something for nothing. You know? So let's take it one step let's take it back to religion one second. When I said that we we buy the ideology without buying the context, you will find all of these Christians, these good Christians, who talk about the Ten Commandments and how one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. But then in that very same book of the Bible, God literally instructs the Israelites to go into this city and kill everyone. Do not leave a child even alive. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about context... And we talk about ideology, we cannot divorce them from one another, or that means we immediately put ourselves in a state of hypocrite hypocrisy and then also end up buying into cognitive dissonance. And what we just saw with the Willie Lynch letter was a mass experiment in cognitive dissonance. Period. We yeah. find black people saying, Hey, we need to be strong and we need to come together and rise up and believe in ourselves and believe in each other, but we're going to believe that because some imaginary white man told us. Right. Right. Instead of just giving up the info. Don't poem on me, bro. Just let me yeah. get that. And all of this comes back to expectation management, which is like the, the things that we've had in conversation, you know what I'm saying, between me having conversations with both of you guys individually, is that we don't need everybody, bro. We just need the right reasonable people. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's why my book, I felt like, was my me throwing my hat in the ring and trying to, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, you know, get us on some sheet of music. People that, that's looking for some sort of um, reference point. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want to ever feel like I'm trying to give somebody direction. Because they already, that's, that's like me assuming that somebody doesn't have any direction. You know what I'm saying? But maybe right. you need another waypoint on your path. You know what I'm saying? Let me be part of that rather than just always identifying the areas where you shouldn't go. You know what I'm saying? Here's where I've been, and maybe you can benefit from that. You know? Maybe you can incorporate something that, you know, came from my personal experience into yours, or maybe to help you rationalize one that you currently endure. But, like, our experiences don't mean anything. Person, Our personal experiences to have no value unless we share them with somebody else. Exactly. Say that again. You know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. like, yeah. like, yeah. like, who, who am I without you? Who, who are we? Who are we? Who are we without each other? We are individuals <laughs> on a journey with no, with no endpoint. Yeah. We also have no support. Well, I'll tell you, a I'm, journey, I'm, I'm, but a journey I'm with no endpoint is something. wandering, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm in the process of writing something, um, and I, I'm going to let you read it when I'm finished, because I think you'll appreciate it. Okay. It's called, Everything I Need to Know I Learned from My Drill Sergeant. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. And one of the things, and my dress are exactly my Facebook friend. You never comments on my stuff, but I, I know he sees it because he consistently shows my feed. That's the way Facebook algorithms work. Right. So one of the things that he told me that I didn't understand until I applied it to my personal life, he said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Man, look. Hey, mm. hey, look. <laughs> hey, yeah, you can't. Ain't nothing you can really yeah, say about, about that. All you need. Yeah, yeah, you can just pack your little bag and be on your way after that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get your little Walmart bag and your stick, man, and go and get the hell on the body. Yeah, you and know? go ahead, man, and, and go and go find it. Yep. But that's but see that's what made me look at and see at the, when it finally hit me, I realized that I was making bad decisions in dating, and that's where it initially hit me, and then I realized I was making bad decisions. And friendships I was holding on to, well, associations rather, that I was holding on to. And then it made me realize that I had spent five years at that point holding on to associations that meant me no good. Man, toxic relationships, I, bro. I, I wasn't I, I wasn't going I wasn't going anywhere. I was stagnant, not because because I was with people who literally just wanted to jump on my back. Well, I can't fly with every, everybody that's around you ain't with you. Right. You know, like, and, and sometimes, man, like I've, I've always used this analogy as a tree. You know, the analogy of people in your life as a tree, right? You got some folks that's on, um, th that's roots that feed you. They go find the nutrients to make you better. Right. And then some folks are branches and some folks are leaves. Sometimes we assign people the role of branches in our lives when they should be leaves. Leaves come and go. But branches are, yeah. are significant because if they break off, they do a lot of damage. Think about that. When a branch breaks off, it's usually going to tear up a tree on somebody else's property, right? Mm -hmm. So if you got the people that should be branches assigned on the side of leaves... And the person that should be a leaf that's assigned as a branch. When that branch breaks, you can't get them them folks back. You see what I'm saying? Nope. They gone. That's real. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I tell you, this is something that I think we should apply as a community, but also, you know, I've I applied it my personal life. It's something my dad always told me. And I applied it the same way that I applied the uh the thought process if you want to go far go together. Mm -hmm. My dad always said, you know, you need to spend your time with people who are going on the right elevator. When you walk into an elevator, you press a button. That means you have a desire to go somewhere. And so you may have a desire to go up. But the thing is, there may be an elevator that comes along, and that elevator is going down. You that, And it may be a girl on that elevator that looks real good. <laughs> hey, man. Look, hey, we better get... Been to hop on, and I've been known to hop on an elevator. <laughs> Especially if she's going down. Yeah. <laughs> always the homeboy how come it's always the homeboy you know what i'm saying how come it ain't never well, I, just you <laughs> like how come well, you ain't got right. the job? No, no, no. You right. the decision to get on that elevator yeah it's true you gotta go kick it. yeah yeah oh i get it they just presented you with the opportunity yeah but then there's another thing though you may there may be an open the, the elevator may open up at your floor because somebody decided they wanted to go down but then saw an elevator going up and thought it was a different option a better option and so that elevator opened up, and you just stepped on thinking, oh, this may be faster. I'll go down one floor and then come back up. When in reality, that elevator can take you all the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. That might be the last elevator. That, it might be the last elevator you ever get on. Yeah, it's true. And so it's, it's one of those things where, like, my dad gave me that analogy. And it's like, it's like those things don't come together until you get older. And you're like, damn, I wish you would have just told me the lesson. But I had yeah. to like, yeah. It don't matter if you yeah, look. Give you the answers, bro. Hey man, you can't I give you, the answers. you can't give nobody advice that ain't that they don't have their hand raised. They're not gonna listen to it. Mm -mm. 
Mm-mm. You ain't ready to receive it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I got on a lot of elevators with pretty women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't until I realized that it was pretty women on those elevators going up, too, that I was like, wait a minute, man, what am I doing with myself? Yeah. That was my biggest mm-hmm. distraction. And I don't blame those young ladies. I don't blame anybody for my own poor decisions or my or my or my wrongdoing. What I do blame is myself for being distracted when I knew better. Yeah. That's the part where that's the part that makes you upset is when you knew better and you chose not to. Like I, I you like at a certain point in your life when you mature enough, you don't get upset by how you've been misled. You get upset because you didn't trust yourself enough to go back and vet. Right. You ain't doing enough vet. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, yeah, you ain't mad at them for being trash. You mad at yourself for being trash with them. Man, look. You yeah, know, that's right. They ain't got in that dumpster. Man, look. Right. And that's why that's I gotta fix my credit now. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, facts. You got, got on too many down elevators. But not man. Oh, man. Boy, you hey, everything's going down. Boy, I'm 35 stupid. years old. About my first washer and dryer. I feel, I feel like a real child right now. <laughs> That's an accomplishment, bro. Hey. I'm, I'm proud of myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you might know I'm going to load in tonight. Yeah, I'm going to load in tonight. Bro, I got the one with the app too, where you can do it on Wi-Fi and you can and you can tell it to ask them all the time. Hey, I'm going to get the Cadillac of washers and dryers, bro. bro you oh, that's what's up. Yeah, hey man, look. I got the Cadillac. Hey Chad, before before I let you go, man, like while you out here got the CTSV washing machine, uh, <laughs> hey, go ahead and tell all the listeners, man, about your podcast and give me a little bit of uh, of a caption about it. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, my podcast is called Kind of Sleepy. We're actually on a two week break right now. We start recording again on Sunday, so we have actually three episodes that are going to drop Sunday. That's our last episode of 2018. Uh, the first episode of 2019, which is basically going to be called Fuck R. Kelly. And then uh, this episode that we're having this coming Sunday is going to be, uh, we're actually going to do a real musical discussion. And we're going to talk about the top uh, 20 albums of the last 50 years. Oh, man. And so, oh. And this is, so it's going to be me, um, the, the love of my life, as well as my co-host. Her name is uh, Miss E.P. And uh, DJ B. Wood, he's going to be on there, too. And we're going to try to get Natty, who is my who is my regular co-host, on there as well. Um, and the reason this conversation came about is because we said that, number one, I said that India Ari is overrated for her place in music, musical history. Mm. And then we also were debating the place of Lauryn Hill's miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Uh, oh, in, yeah. In some, of the, some of the greats. I was like, just about oh, yeah, to say, Ari maybah, maybe you like correlating that. those two, uh, India Ari and Lauryn uh-huh. Hill. Those two together, yep. Okay. Yep. All right. all that together. But the reason it's called kind of sleepy is because everybody wants to be woke out here. But the thing is, being woke, honestly, is kind of a job sometimes. Um, you got to remember who the boycott. You got to remember, you know, who's canceled. Um, you got to make sure you show up to all the public dragons and things of that nature. <laughs> so personally, I don't really have time for all that because I got babies to raise and I got to try to fix my credit, like I was saying. So mm-hmm. I was first right. kind of sleepy. So we're kind of like woke yes. adjacent. We admit that we don't yeah. know everything, and we admit that, you know, some things, is, we're still learning. Right. We may still have some toxic ideas and principles, but we're still growing, and we're still learning, and you, we're trying to get through that, and we're trying to work through that. Man, it's all about leaving room to have that. your opinion changed. You know what I'm saying? That's what it is, man. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Man, but I ain't going to hold yeah, you Yeah, man, up. we dropped that link, man. Yeah, drop that. Put the, oh, link, yeah, in the, yeah. put the link in the comments, man. You know what I'm saying? And matter of fact. Well, dude. I'm going to start uh, getting your links, and then I'm going to put them in my caption as well, man. You know what I'm saying? That way we can network and share, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, where where we can be located. Uh, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and, and also, uh, I, I got to tell you, um, I'm, I, I actually bought your – I actually gave your copy of my book – uh, I gave my copy of your book to my homeboy, so I'm about to buy me another copy. Just had to let you know. Yeah, hey, man, I appreciate uh, that. I was, I was talking about your book so much that my homeboy was like, well, let me read it. I was like, okay, <laughs> I know I got it back. So. Hey, man, that's what's up, yeah. man. That's a good sign. If he ain't bring it back, either he ain't finished or he reading it again or – or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Oh, no, he definitely read. He definitely reading it. So I'm, I'm, and I'm probably gonna buy another copy because I got another homeboy that I that I want to read that I want to read it too. So yes, yeah. well, I'm, I'm spreading the good gospel of Vic out here, man. Yeah, man. Hey, you know what? That 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 uh, the book of Vic. That make my chest feel big, bro. You know what I'm saying? For the right, right. reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bro, yeah, man, yeah. hell yeah. It's spread you shape like juggernaut. <laughs> 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 Holy shit! Hey man! Oh man! I, for the rest of us. Hey man! Get get your, <laughs> Hey man! 
Hey man, get your ass off of here, muscle shaming me and shit, man. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't laugh like I want to. That shit is funny. <laughs> hey, I'm not going gluten free and losing weight. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm about to hit the ejection button on chat. Muscles for the women. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done, y'all. <laughs> well, y'all ain't shit, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> Don't you put that on me, Ricky Bobby. I am shit. My mama told me. <laughs> All right, Chad, bro. I'm going to holler at you, man. All right, brother. Y'all be great, yeah. man. Yeah. All right, bro. Peace. Man, look. This been a good-ass segment right here, man. I didn't know it was going to be this. This, uh, Man, um, man look. I, I got to get to the to the last one. You know what I'm saying? Burdens disguised as unconditional love. That's the last myth that we're going to discuss. And then we're going to move on to a couple other topics because they may go pretty quick. Leaving that, man, we already been yeah, alive. Yeah, put my feet up on this one. Yeah, so um, burdens disguised as unconditional love. You know what I'm saying? So, Drew, remember that day we was talking about, you know, myths in general. We just came and I made the post just to attract people's opinion about it or whatever. And... Mm-hmm. Um, when a lot of times I don't know what I want to say until I put my fingers on a keyboard or something. And then when I start seeing the words, it just, you know, they come to be. And when I say, when I say that is, um, a lot of times, man, when we look at people in our own families, uh, well, let, let's first talk about the myth of unconditional love. Cause that's a myth too, in itself. Mm-hmm. It's like, you remember that song, uh, I ain't got no type. And then the very next bar was, bad bitches is the only thing that I like. Bad is the only thing I like. But right. the, ain't that a type? It's definitely a type. <laughs> it's a I've t- had many arguments about it. <laughs> and the only response I ever get is, man, fuck all that. That's your heart. Okay. So, unconditional love is a myth in that regard, too. Because don't you have to meet certain conditions to qualify for unconditional love? Yes, one hundred percent. Because it's, it's something, something, it's certain things that you do that I don't love you anymore. Automatically. Correct. Like you go from being in love to just loving that person to saying I got love for them, but fuck that bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like you really go to right. that the, to that extreme, right? So, so with that being an, um, uh, it's almost an oxymoron in itself. That's exactly what it is. Um, we sometimes put the the description of having unconditional love on a person that is in our family, that's really a burden. Mm. So we get caught up in talking about, I'm going to always be there for family, but you there for a person that's not even there for themselves. Right. But see, we say, it, yeah, I'm going to always be there for family, but you need to be paying attention to where they take you. <laughs> say that again, man. I don't even know why I just that's, caught that's, just then, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, right, yeah. That's a, a common bar that we, I'm going to always stick up and be there for family. I'm going to always be there for family, no that's, matter what. That's a dangerous slate, especially when, you know, sometimes folks have folks in their family that do dangerous stuff. They put their family's name at risk. You know what I'm saying? Like Uncle Junior. And then look at you like, yeah, are you going to ride? Yeah. Like, Uncle Junior, you can't come in here every week asking me, "Am I gonna ride?" I'm not riding every week, Uncle Junior. No, and it's and we and we gonna blame everything on Uncle Junior today too, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he's just a theoretical uncle. We, I, yeah. I don't have an uncle named Junior. No, neither do I. You know what I'm saying? But like Uncle Junior usually be the uh, for for those of y'all that don't know, Uncle Junior do all the shit that we blame the crackhead uncle. Uncle Junior is the crackhead, the pedophile. The uh the the dope boy that can't stay out of jail, um, and and the one uncle that always steal at your house. You know what I'm saying? So you can't have unconditional love for somebody you won't let come in your house. Right. That's not. That's con- That's that's what I'm saying. That's I'm conditions. You from outside on the pull up. Like, you're not even welcome inside. I'm loving you from the porch. <laughs> Yo, and, 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 and this other thing too, man. A lot of times we associate superpowers 
to family members that don't do anything exceptional. You know what I'm saying? Like, ain't nothing exceptional about family, okay? Like, your mom and dad had whatever plumbing required to make a child. So, right. your relatives are born by default. Y'all family because y'all just related. You know what I'm saying? Like, your parents are, you know what I'm saying, aunts and uncles. Um, it's... Um, it's it's nothing supernatural about that. You know what I'm saying? The thing that makes it great is when your family can come together and get their, you know what I'm saying, to do something positive for the betterment of the family, to not misrepresent the family. You know what I'm saying? That's when your family becomes special, exceptional, and again, earns that unconditional love, un earns that title, earns that defense. You know what I'm saying? But... A lot of people have been historically held back or made stagnant or caused their wheels to burn in place under this myth that unconditional love for their family should come at every cost. And that's not, you know, that's not true. You know what I'm saying? It's just not possible. It's not sustainable, especially when you're dealing with an unpredictable person. You know what I'm saying? If you're constantly saying, what did he get locked up for this time? Oh, which, oh, okay, so we're talking about Uncle Junior and, and to preserve gender equality, man. Who are we going to call aunt, Auntie who? Uh, I don't, I, I, what's a good, what's a good aunt, wild auntie name? Like, who's the wild auntie out here? Uh, a wild auntie. Uh, what's a wild auntie name, y'all? Um, since um, we call with Uncle Junior, let's, uh, Auntie Charmaine sounds like she would be wild. Aunt, aunt, somebody, I, I got know. Aunt Pearl, Aunt Faye. Aunt, we gonna go Auntie Charmaine. Let's go Aunt Pearl. We go with a wild Aunt Pearl, Pearl kind of yeah. old, but like let's just talk about old yeah. ass Aunt Pearl that's toxic as hell. And she thinks she's gotten to the point where she can just say. Anything. Whatever she want to say. Anything. Right over the potato salad. And which, <laughs> right here next to the potato salad. You're going to get your shit off. Which goes like kind of in line with what Chad was talking about. We got ageism, colorism, and stuff like that. We're going to go ahead and... Uh, uh, I, I see an Aunt Shella in there. I, I like Shella. You want to go with Shella? Yes, that works. Okay, Aunt Shella thinks she can say any and everything. You know what I'm saying? She can give relationship advice, but you ain't never seen her with a man. You ain't never seen her happy. You know what I'm saying? Like, but Aunt Shella got it figured out. You know what I'm saying? But the metrics don't add up. She toxic. You know what I'm saying? She is constantly in the midst of something. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you can love Aunt Shella, but from the front porch. You can love her from, you know, like the parking lot or something like that. But Aunt Shella mm -hmm. doesn't need to have a constant presence in your life. Oh, we got an Aunt Lavinia, too. You know what I'm saying? Oh. She wild. <laughs> Aunt Lavinia uh, uh, is, 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 you know what I'm saying, by default, her name means fight. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure that's what it translates right. to. Right. Yes. Yes. She I, got all the group chats. She fight. got. <laughs> you know, it's different sets of group chats in the family. She got all the group chats. Yep. And Lavinia and every group chat. La, yeah, Lavinia, Lavinia with the shit. You know what I'm saying? For the wrong reasons, though. But we gotta be careful not to be fooled by the myths of um, unconditional love disguised as burdens under the same type of tactic that the Willie Lynch letter was. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a rhetoric that's been associated with that. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, I'm not opposed to, um, you know, doing stuff to put family in a great position. I do think that you could do business with some family. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like, but if your principles ain't right individually, that's, it's not sustainable. Like right now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we blood, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, matter of fact, when I get this layout right, the next time, you know what I'm saying? We got these technical difficulties. I'm gonna make sure we put up some of our kid uh, pictures every time, you know what I'm saying? They come up because... This right, ain't right. this this thing that we got, you know what I'm saying, is a it's a regular chemistry driven conversation that's based on history and we got, you know what I'm saying, a rapport established. We done seen, you know what I'm saying, some things in our individual lives that make us, 
collectively better, a better unit. You know what I'm saying? We're a whole unit for real. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, we need to take that and make sure that we represent our family. We need, like, we love each other unconditionally. You know what I'm saying? We've had a chance to demonstrate that over time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and everybody don't need to know that whole walk. You know, it's un it's unnecessary, right. but like, um, we, we've been there for each other, you know what I'm saying? For the right reasons and not just out of convenience and we don't have a transactional relationship, but a lot of times people don't realize that they got transactional relationships in their own family. You know what I'm saying? Meaning like mm. that motherfucker don't ever do that for me. So why I got to be over there? You know what I'm saying? What they want to do now? Right. And it's, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so Way too much of that goes on, man. Yeah. So, um only a mother's love is unconditional. I don't know about that, Kevin. It, nope. Like that's got conditions too. It's got conditions too. Because like um black women have a lot of toxic relationships with their own mothers. So they they may feel responsible more than they feel that unconditional love because like if you it's certain things that you could say in principle are true, but actions and policy always dictate the other. So that's what I'm saying. That's one of them things where if you just take it as a fact without exploring the metrics and putting it, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in the right light, you're going to be trapped in the myth too. You know what I'm saying? Yep. you be supporting the myth. Yep. So... Don't you can't get blinded and engulfed by that rhetoric, man. You know what I'm saying? Rhetoric isn't always fact. Just because a lot of people repeating it, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you gotta unpack that stuff sometimes. You know, matter of fact, we're at a stage in life where we gotta unpack everything. You know what I'm saying? Everything. Like research the research, research. Yep. You know, so we gotta it's check, so check easy for, me, for me to hear uh, a, uh, you know, a flashy quote. And I start sharing that thing around, and y'all think it's lying. Yeah, you know, you got it in a nice font in black and white on a meme. You know what I'm saying? On a meme generator. Right. So now you you the originator, but like we've given the titles of originator to people that just the first to repost something, not the first to actually create it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you giving them the credit for the quote. Yeah, man. So. Um, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to, to add on to, uh, you know what I'm saying? The burden disguises unconditional love. But like, if you take that, that quote and that thought into your relationships that you have with your friends, maybe your significant other, certain family members and people that you have a high level of respect for that may be on the threshold of qualifying for that unconditional love, you better look at it, you know what I'm saying? In great detail and the great, in great metrics, you know, um, George says, yeah, uh, George, like to me, George, that George says, uh, unconditional love is only a clever way to disguise codependency. I don't agree with that. I think, mm. I think mm. it may be true for some people, <clears throat> but if you come in from a survival, um, level background, and what I mean by that is if you come from something that is rooted in nothing, like financially, uh, relationship poverty, intellectual poverty, or whatever. Yeah, everything looks like there's a catch to it. You know what I'm saying? But what isn't a catch? Like, you have to catch somebody right. in order to see if they qualify for unconditional love anyway. So I don't think that that's the case. Yes. You, know? you still got to sift through the power. Right. You know? So, um, as far as human beings are concerned, it's hard to qualify somebody for unconditional love once you've live the life that leads you to, you know, like your own personal peace. And if you're willing to protect that at all costs, you're going to vet the right way. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Nobody gets an instant pass until they don't have a pass again. Like you got to give people enough right. room to meet the expectations that they put out there, not the ones that you set for them. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why, like, you know, like we talked before, we don't get mad when somebody mishandles us. You know what I'm saying? We get mad at our, we don't get mad at them. We get mad at ourselves. You know, right? Because it's easy being out there like that. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Like we either overlook some, or or opted to um, not investigate. You know what I'm saying? The red flags was there. You know, like and when you get yeah, older, we, you can yeah. look back and see it. And, but you, that's because you can you can only look back and see something after you can appreciate the lesson that you that you gained out of it. Because it's not a loss; it's yeah, a lesson. You got it. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And if you if you can if you can see the fall, nigga, that means you caught the lesson. So, mm-hmm. just a little, just a little tuition and your learning experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mara just asked, so for unconditional love to exist, does it need to be reciprocated on both sides? I don't care if it is reciprocated. It's still met with condition. That's what the re- reciprocation is. Yep. You know, that's what the reciprocity mm-hmm. is about. That's why unconditional love is a way call Yeah, that's that, that's like you can earn a pass in some ways. You know what I'm saying? But like, even if you meet the criteria for loving somebody unconditionally, how long can they do so many things before you say, yes. you know what, exactly. it's not healthy anymore, right? So right. that means the love is conditional. Because it's got an expiration date. Ain't no unlimited minutes. Hey, so Kevin says, what about the spouse? Uh, the work of your the work of you as a spouse and the spouse that you have, that's the work that identifies if your love is redeemable. You know what I'm saying? People get divorced every day, B. And they say they loved each other unconditionally. Every day. Right. You said all that shit. I'm a two-time loser in that regard, so I know how that goes. Okay. Um, no, you're a two-time winner. <laughs> You'd be a loser if you stayed oh, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, oh, man. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but even in those, I, you know what I'm saying? I took my, I played a part in that situation I working out, too. Yeah, but so it takes... So, yeah, that was just me up on the other person. Which, is go, which goes back to the point that it's a lesson, too. Like, if you can't go back yeah. and evaluate what you did to contribute to, you know what I'm saying, that outcome, and, you know what I'm saying, like, you got some issues, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you missed it. You yeah, missed you missed it completely. And you can go out here and mess up another relationship. Mm-hmm. So, see, Squeaky just said, my motto is this. I love unconditionally, but I won't stay unconditionally. That's stay a condition. Hey, I like that. But that's a condition. That's a condition. <laughs> that's, a condition. <laughs> that's a condition. So we can just, yeah, so let's just put unconditional love to bed. They, if they don't, uh, those unco- shouldn't be in the city together. Unconditional love is butterfly shrimp. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it's buffalo wings. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> ah. <laughs> Man, excuse me for that. I can't laugh the way I want to. I had neck surgery yesterday and I ain't trying not to bust one of these stickers in my neck. Yo. That boy said it's shit is butterfly strip. <laughs> it is. It's it's like you've never seen uh shrimp and butterflies hump each other? You know what I'm saying? Huh. So. Oh, man. Yeah. So, we got to quit. That was funny. <laughs> we got to quit assigning these these poor expectation management descriptions on things. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And we make it shit harder than it got to be. Bro. You out here trying to prove your unconditional love. And and then like the other thing is like you got to struggle, you know what I'm saying, and work in your relationship and stuff like that. Now, man, I just got to improve myself, you know. Like mm-hmm. if, if I work on myself, if both parties working on themselves and they want to be together, then why wouldn't they be better? Especially if they making the relationship about the other person, you know. Right, which is what a relationship is. Man, look, it's got to be from about the other. how are you? performing in this relationship for the other person man look it's all about reciprocity not and you can't and, and reciprocity is the condition of love i love scotch unconditionally yeah yeah because scotch ain't gonna never do nothing to hurt your feelings you know what i'm saying oh shit. scotch ain't gonna do nothing but teach you you know what i'm saying especially if you have too much yeah yeah i gotta relax man these things are gonna come out to teach <laughs> Hey, you know I love Scotch unconditional. Look, any man or woman that's watching this right now that's had a divorce loves that their, their, their spouse at some uh point unconditionally, or either they uttered the words, you know what I'm saying, or repeated them. And that's not yeah. the case. You know what I'm saying? It's just not. You lied to them. Yeah. And you lied to yourself. Mm-hmm. Because you ignore some shit. You know what I'm saying? Straight up. Yep. But uh um, And you know what? I think the work you only try to con- di- unconditionally love someone when they're doing some fuck shit. That's the only time unconditional love comes into the conversation. Right. Because, like, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, 
Y- you know what I'm saying? I ain't worried about, I ain't worried about loving that. you outside of your bullshit. Right. right. You right. gotta be bringing up some bullshit for me to even be thinking that way. Man, look. Like, you got to be in a certain space that, like, you're already grasping, you know what I'm saying, at straws. You're trying to hang on something, hang on to something that don't want to be held on to. Right. Man, look, Mike hit yeah. me. Mike said, you think you love unconditionally until a condition comes up. Facts. Big facts. Bro, I done seen people leave their spouse when they get sick. Big facts. Big facts. I've seen it. In the workplace, like <laughs> one person in a relationship was in chemo, no hair. What's up with so and so? We're not together anymore. Uh, grimy. In some ways, he it's good. is true. Trash. Trash. Tra- trash will be an but, improvement. But we have to we have to think about it too. Sometimes everybody can't carry that weight. Hmm. And this, and if you can't carry that weight, I need you to get out of here before my hair falls out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I can't focus on recovery if you dragging me down with your bullshit. Yeah. We got to have one focus when I when I'm terminally ill, or maybe terminally ill. We got to get me out of here. I can't be sitting over here feeling the, listening to your weak ass feelings about how you feel neglected in the relationship, and I'm plugged up to a machine. Yeah, like like your pity party. It's just like um, uh, man, it's just like man, your pity and get the hell out of here. That's that's so true, bro. It's like don't know, but the last thing you want to do is bring your misery to somebody else's uh, uh pity. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, man, no. Mm-mm. Like you got to spell it out. All of it added the pity party, but like when you spell it out, like yo, I'm in a low place. Don't bring like, and then I, then you hit me up and say, all right, man, I'm gonna bring my low feelings over there too. That's not what I need right now. Right. I told you no, where I was I'm at. in a low place, and you, you, know, you show up with a shovel. Oh, what we yeah. doing, fam? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, mm-hmm. so we on the same sheet of music with that joint, man. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move to. Let me get on the sports topic, man. We've been talking philosophical stuff. You know oh what I'm saying, for yeah. Me. Oh Ooh-wee. yeah. That's what we've been waiting on right here. Yeah. I've been seeing them comments too. Hey. Yeah. This, this one. A lot of people been waiting on this one right here. All right. Hey, hey, folks. Saints fans. And the reaction from the NFC title game outcome. Yeah, man, see, I just need some church organs right now. Just the organs. I don't need the drums. Just the organs. <laughs> I need y'all to step on down, man. To the to the, to the altar, man. It's an altar call for y'all Saints fans, man. Hey, let, let me go ahead. This is an altar call. <laughs> hey, so so let me go ahead and, and and let me go ahead and, and say my piece on it, man, because I'm gonna let you have this topic, all right? Since you brought it up earlier. So, number one, I didn't watch the game. I watched the highlights, okay? Um, I am a huge fan. And I got some principles about how I watch football in general. I um, don't believe in putting the game in the hands of the ref and then blaming the ref, okay? Number one. The other thing is is that I also know that over a four-quarter game, you know, you can't blame it on one play. Um, I looked at a couple of the, the, um, the red zone possessions and they scored 13 points on three possessions. Um, and when they've had, you know, a lot of red zone success, you know, so to me, that tells the story that the Rams did their job defensively. Also, mm-hmm. where, where did the Saints defense just not make a stop? You know what I'm saying? In a situation, you know, um, so I understand that the game uh, is a game of inches, and it's a game of decisions, you know what I'm saying, made by coaches and stuff like that. I get it. But um, as an Alabama fan, we can't sit up here and find every reason why somebody lost a game. You know, sometimes you got to say that we didn't execute, you know? Um. There are some people that's t- talking about the NFL is rigged, um, and if you if you say that and you watch it, then how do you get angry? You know that's that's my question to that. Okay. Uh, okay. And if it's a predetermined outcome, then what's the whole point of the the the, the season? Is it rigged only when it's playoff time? Or is it rigged all season? I need to know these things. 
you know. Or is it on the rig when your team loses? Okay. Now, my, my man uh, Byron said the call was blatant, though. I, I see that. All I'm saying is is that if you put the game in the hands of the ref, you know what I'm saying, like you, you, know, you leave yeah. it the chance. And I'm not saying that the call shouldn't have been made. I'm, I'm not agreeing with the call at all. However, this is what happens when the game, um, when, when you mismanage possessions in the red zone. Right. If you're up 21 to nothing, as you should have been, as opposed to 13 to nothing, that pass in the field call, it doesn't matter. Nope. How many points did they lose by? Three? Four? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> okay, you get two touchdowns instead of two field goals. What are we talking about? He can carry dude into the third row, and it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But see, my thing is with the with the Saints, it ain't even about nothing that go got going on on the field. And the people that I'm talking to know exactly who I'm talking to. Y'all run up and down that timeline, that house sports and whatever other sports group that we all a part of, right? About specifically Bama fans. Like, they talk about Bama fans and Cowboy fans like they are the worst losers, like, in sports history. Y'all motherfuckers out here with a whole lawsuit, bro. Yeah. Y'all got players tweeting articles, section, do your job with Dale. Y'all out here trying to get a rematch on an NFL football. This ain't Pee Wee football, bro. You can't run it back. <laughs> That's what next season's for. Ain't no way. Right, y'all trying to say fans out with y'all running back face asses out here trying to trying to play back two minutes. Hey, hey, my man. Also, a blown call. <laughs> Yo, it, it's, it's like, it, it's not even realistic. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that people can get on uh, 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 some some real litigation logic behind a football game and disregard other things that require litigation, you should be you should feel kind of salty about that in other ways, I think, you know? Man, fam. Out of all the things you can get away with. Right. Y'all out here playing with tax money. Trying to get back a game. Y'all lost, bro. Take the, I I no dog, no, shut up. Just take the L. <laughs> say say y'all ain't taking this L, man. Y'all have not Taking it, it's waiting. On, it's, the air is sitting out there lonely. He's yeah. waiting for you to come and pick him up. Bake fresh. Go pick up your air. School was closed two hours ago. <laughs> your air is late. Go pick up your air. <laughs> Go get that motherfucker, man. Go get that air and put it on. Wear it. Put it in your trunk. Fold it up. All nice and neat. Shit. Take it home and wear it. Y'all stand over if I y'all got billboards. Y'all got billboards in Atlanta. <laughs> but two weeks ago y'all was laughing at Falcons fans talking about we gonna win the Super Bowl on your field. Bruh, they had they but had now you out here, They had shirts that said New Orleans. New Orleans. Now y'all out here leasing billboard space. <laughs> come, come on, man. How the how the mighty have fallen? Say say y'all trash out here. Y'all are trash out here, man. <laughs> Stop crying. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it was it was perfect timing. Like, I watched that whole game. Yeah. Saints fans. Your quarterback sucked in that game. Man, what? Let's go ahead and call it what it is. Drew Brees didn't play well. He got outplayed by the golf by golf with two Fs. He <laughs> outplayed Drew Brees at the crib. He did it. <laughs> the refs ain't do it, man. Refs ain't do it. Drew Brees was trash in that game. How many picks did he have? After that first, he threw one. I remember one. Maybe it was two. I thought it was two. But he, it was a, but he, but he probably had three almost picks. <laughs> that, like, yeah. if they would have got those, they would have ran y'all. Mm-hmm. Y'all were closer to getting ran than that car was to beating you. You y'all let the Rams stay in that game, and that's what happens, man. That shit is classic. Yeah. If you go to that red zone and you start kicking field goals and not getting touchdowns, you are asking to get beat at the end. That's how it works. It just so happened that it ended up being on a bad call. 
But mm-hmm. nobody talks about it. The guy would have just turned around and not panicked. He would have picked it off. He would have picked six y'all right out your own building. Yep, that's true. If he had been watching Why, the ball. Y'all talk, right. Y'all talking about the call. The throw was just as bad as the call. The throw was horrible. Okay. But we ain't going to talk about that. Yeah. Nah, fam. Drew Brees had a bad game. I wouldn't say he choked because I don't throw that word around. And because a Hall of Fame. You're not going to say he choked. Mm-hmm. He got outplayed by Jared Goff, though. I'll say that. Man, spot on. You know what I'm saying? That, I ain't nothing else to add to that shit, man. It's just a, it, if people want to hear it again, back it up, man. Rewind it. You know what I'm saying? When, when, when the live one. Where the hell? Because y'all, Bama fans and Cowboy fans in particular get labeled as sore losers. But I have yet to see a petition, a lawsuit. And y'all claim Bama fans, like, it's just going like, I live in Alabama, so it's like when we lose, it's like, oh, it ain't Auburn fans that get on the town. I'd be like, it ain't even safe to go out in the street. These Bama fans on the rampage, like they might hurt one of y'all, right? That's how we get laid. We ain't filed no legal representation yet, though. I thought that was hilarious <laughs> that you're going to file a lawsuit over a playoff game. You imagine that come across somebody's desk in the morning? Man, listen. And then and they had that thing up there fast too, cause the game was on Sunday, right? Right. And then it was. And they had billboards up shortly after. Bro. Soon as the city of New Orleans was open for business, that lawsuit was ready to be filed. Yep. That was on the docket early that day. Some got pushed back man. because of that. Mm-hmm. that. Man, look, that that suit came in faster than some beignets come after they take your poor boy away. <laughs> Yeah, I see Sports Weekends was giving money back. I'm not giving you back nothing, man. Mm. Them are, referee is a part of the game. That's just, that call ain't no different than you running a, a slant route and the ball hit the damn referee in the face and get picked off by the other team. It was the real fault, but hell, he part of the game. Mm-hmm. He is a part of the game. So, say same. Let's look. just win that, bro. Man, look. Uh, it's just one of I don't have to change your mind, Mr. Pierce. We never filed a lawsuit. Show me the lawsuit. Man, look, I ain't never seen it. Man, but look. I know goddamn lawsuit. Enough about the Saints, man. They ain't even make it to overtime in the game, so they definitely not going to make it overtime on this. Um, Hell no. All right, so, man, look. Chris Brown. And this false rape charge that everybody was caping to, flying to. Man, what the hell? Why why was people so quick to convict him? Well, I understand why. That's a rhetorical question. You know why? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But like, yeah. I saw somebody compare, compare his situation to Folks that support R. Kelly. Now, I got my opinions about Chris Brown and that whole Rihanna situation that, you know what I'm saying, that got him, you know, uh, the reputation that he's gotten in social media. But I like way they think Rihanna's crazy. You know what I'm saying? She grabbed his – when he explained himself, he said she grabbed his penis and he defended himself. And I can thoroughly believe that. You know what I'm saying? Because okay. – right. I can't see a pattern there, you know what I'm saying, just based on metrics, you know, like where the smoke does fire, you know. I know he had an incident with somebody else later, but I don't think that he's done anything unprovoked, okay. Uh, This whole thing about the chicken pears turned out to be all false, you know. Um, And I'm not a conspiracy theorist or nothing like that, so even when T.I. was like, they're just trying to do that man in because he got his masters. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not ready to, you know what I'm saying, ride that, that logic at all. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't mean that nefarious stuff doesn't happen in, in the music industry to try to, you know what I'm saying, derail artists either. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But, uh, the timing is one thing and the fact that 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 dude is young and successful within, uh, 
uh, his own lane. He's produced. He's written. You know what I'm saying? And, and he he ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Um, no. He's withstood a lot of uh, public criticism, and he's still here. You know, and yes, I I, I don't. I just never. I was never ready to co-sign and write him off. You know what I'm saying? As being, uh, you know, uh, guilty of that. You know what I'm saying? Simply based on social media either way. Anyway, things change real quick. You know what I'm saying? Like we already talked about the Willie Lynch letter and how that was written by a dude in the 70s. And some people were wondering around with that is it's gospel, right? So, right? Somebody brought that up today yes. at work. Right. But this thing right here, we got to stop co-signing without research and without patience. You know what I'm saying? Like it's okay to wait to on not say nothing. It's okay. Just it's wait. okay to read that article and be like, okay, uh, I'm aware. Let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. Right. Yeah. I'm aware. Let's see where it goes. Why would somebody you... post it? You can, you know what I'm saying? Put a dot to be updated later. I'll check on this later. Like something just to keep in the back of your mind. Let's see what the next headline about this is. Yeah. It's like. As soon as you saw Chris Brown rape woman, Paris, get that nigga out of here. Man, look, I saw a post that said the girl was gang raped. And then it turned out the girl later on said, no, that's not what happened. And and my wife was keen to say they used language, you know, in the, in the article originally that said um, detained. Detained and arrested are not the same thing, you know? No. Detained. No. detained you... you being detained is, is, is almost voluntary. That's just... Come down here for questions. questions. Yeah, come down here for questions. Right, are you going to stay and answer the question? Mm-hmm. So, which goes back to a lot of different things, man, that's associated with tactical patience and, and everything else, man, like that we've been discussing, is that you need to understand the definitions of the words that you're using. Because if you use them the wrong way and, and misinterpret them, you mess around and spread some misinformation. You know? Yes, man. But and, 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 and destroy somebody like Chris, we gotta let these kids grow up. I know he's not a kid now. No. I'm sure he's close to thirty, if not thirty. Yeah. But that boy been famous half of his life. He been famous longer his than his entire adult life. Man, he been famous longer than most people been alive. Than than a lot of people been so, alive. Yeah, we have to allow now what he did. You shouldn't put your hands on the wall. Whether he was defending himself, that's all whatever, right? You still have to allow these people to see the error in their way. Yep. You gotta, he wasn't 45 years old when he did that. Nope. And he had no long history of it leading up to that moment either. So Right. And he, has to, he has to figure it out. Yep. Shit happens. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people have been fortunate enough not to have to deal with somebody that they got to put hands on in order to get them to, you know, like... Uh, Right. Uh, you know, I guess, somebody let your knucklehead ass grow up. Yeah, f- straight up. You know what I'm saying? Most people in the timeline could have been killed by something, you know? But you had to reach your own individual po- uh, moment of clarity, you know what I'm saying? To see. Yeah. Like you said, you said a couple weeks ago, everybody, everybody bothered me the same. Nope. Absolutely not, you know? So that was a, that was a huge reach, you know what I'm saying, when, when they were talking about that. But, you know. Are we bored? <laughs> like in general with uh like that that's not enough going on we just gotta add some to the pot that's we gotta how... add some spice mm-hmm. looks that way cause there's some other stuff we could be doing mm-hmm. man so dang and, then, and we went straight somebody went straight to Chris Brown and R. Kelly compares yep and then Here's the other part of the conversation. So after it was determined that he didn't do anything, he's suing the chick, you know what I'm saying, for defamation. And I hope he get everything out of that. Yes, man, because it's got to be more of that. And it's, it, she should face prosecution too, man. That's got to happen. Mm-hmm. That's got to be a direct result of no file, no charges being filed. <clears throat> no, charges should be filed. It just depends on who they're going to be filed against. Because if you're not filing them against me, then you need to be filing them against her. Yeah, a lie. Mm-hmm. Because she needs they should to, at least make you yeah do the paperwork shuffle. Yes, yeah, she make should have the court dates, probation, all that restitution. You should have to go through all of that. Yep. 
And and even if you don't get nothing but half the time that he was about to get just for lying because you didn't actually commit. The- yes. Matter of fact, they need to make a they need to make a law that says double the time that they that they were gonna charge the other person with. Right, but see, even that right there, that's a that might not even be a good idea because then that's just gonna make women not, not want to. You know what I'm saying? But but that they're but, gonna be too scared to get thrown in jail on their own. But that's 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 part of the the point of this conversation too, man. Is that. When women do stuff like that, they do a disservice to other women, you know? Yes, yes. It's not about you. Yes. It, it is about you, but it's, it's not fully about you. Right. Because it's, if it's, you go ahead and, and, and stick your neck out there, man, some people go, somebody going to join in and help. Somebody got that same experience. Yo, it's bigger somebody going to say, yes, yeah, somebody's going to say me too and mean it. Yep. Everything, and, everything you know what I'm saying? It's all, yes, I would love to see you. One woman step out there on her own, and then I look around, and there's ten women together, like trying to, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Trying to, trying to fix the problem. Like that's that's what we need. Like it's okay for women to gang up too. Yep. Man, um... y'all don't have. You know what I'm saying? Like, not that y'all should have to wait on men, but y'all don't have to wait on men to get the party started. Nope, not at all. Man. So, cause we out here with you. Yep. No, no matter what what you see in in um in the media, look left and right. You know what I'm saying? For the mm-hmm. people we out here that you got regular access with too. You know what I'm saying? That's what you need to count as being valid in your in your life and your everyday. You know what I'm saying? Uh, interactions or whatever. So, um, man, like we can't beat that one enough, man. Even though it needs a little bit more work, you know. Because like the work that that it, like all the people that went out there caving for it, they can't even come back and apologize for it. You know what I'm saying? I took some screenshots of some folks that said some some left right shit too. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I felt like that was real grimy. Like like the same kind of belief that some women want us to have in women when they say that they are victims. We need the same kind of reciprocity too when they say that men are the offenders. Because we both have common things that we get associated with too quickly and make it, uh, 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 they, that, that, they later get used to discredit us. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so. Yes. And, if, and if, if I was a person going through a situation like Chris, I wouldn't be looking for support right out the gate. Silence would make me feel better if I was getting correct. If I wasn't reading anything from my community about what what they're accusing me until, uh, especially un- unless um, until I get hit with some charges, you know what I'm saying? Right. Because like that means that my community is they thinking mm-hmm. they not just rushing to the judgment point. Yep. Like everybody want to be first to 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 slam them. Like I got to be the first one to get him on the mat. Right. Mm-hmm. So, in that regard, man, it's like <clears throat> we got we got a lot of growing to do, and I think that the potential for that is a whole lot higher. And I hate to say that incidents like that make it possible, but we don't have to stay there. You know what I'm saying? That's not the lowest point. You know, we, we can um, we can benefit from that. I think a lot of people have learned from that particular situation, um, what they had an opportunity to learn from it, whether or not. Is learning it. It matters if if another incident comes up like that with somebody else, will they apply what they saw from this situation? You know what I'm saying? Because the turnaround on this thing was case quick. Case by case, man. But this yeah. that turnaround was quick on that thing too. Like it might have oh, been yeah. it might have been 18 hours. Might have. Um, you didn't have to wait long. No. You could have slept on it. If you would have went to sleep and woke up the next morning, you you'd have some resolve. Yeah. Yep. Um. So we got one more topic, man, and then we're gonna close it down for the night, bro. Um, and it's not a whole lot to hit on, but it's it's about perspective on uh, police brutality. You know, I'm gonna try to make sure I have a segment that's dedicated to highlighting one issue with police brutality because there's so many um, that when they happen, they get lost in the waves of another one or, or whatever else is, catches our attention. You know what I'm saying? Because there's so much information. Like uh, I usually, I remember this line from uh, my Dr. Dre song. Was like uh, you can swim in. It's so much information that if you swim in the information, you can drown in the specifics. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So if we focused on one specific thing, we can get inundated with it and, you know what I'm saying, lose a lot of situation awareness. But, like, so do you remember a couple years ago when Philando Castile got killed, right? That happened in uh, Minnesota, right? We, I think we all yep. know the particulars of that. But just to reiterate, he was a, a NRA card-holding, you know what I'm saying, licensed gun owner. And he was shot by a cop as a passenger in the seat when he was told to produce his credentials for his weapon. And the cop lost his uh, shit and shot him up, you know what I'm saying, in front of his girlfriend and his daughter. And his girlfriend filmed it live. And it was a significant yep. uh, event. Uh, in that same window of time, um, there was a Somali-born American black American police officer that shot this Australian chick and she actually was uh, believed to have attacked the officer. The officer feared for his life and he shot the lady, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. The cop that shot Philando Castile is free. Uh, Went through all the court proceedings and they said he operated within uh, uh, you know, like somewhat procedures I guess you could say, but basically he didn't do enough to warrant being convicted of any type of murder or negligent death. The black Somali-born American black cop got charged with intentional murder for what he did to the white lady. Now, this man was a cop. You know what I'm saying? The thin blue line didn't matter to him. And, um... And I'm and I'm he I'm bringing this. Blue. Yep, and I'm only bringing this up. I'm not trying to debate about it or nothing like that. But I have constantly said that the American justice system has displayed multiple, uh, you know, like events where it is there to ensure uh, white people and their safety. It's in, it's always been designed that way. Casual killing laws in Virginia, where you know, like uh, they can kill a black slave or a black freed man at the time that, you know, under like real, you know, uh, uh, trivial I- issues, you know, and only pay a small fine, you know. If you go back and look at those casual killing laws, and I got a video somewhere on my Facebook that I'll probably repost later, uh, not tonight, but probably tomorrow, to echo the same point, you'll see that these institutions that we work for, that they tell us that we've been coached to believe that, our vehicles for us improving our own communities, we still don't have the same uh, benefit of the doubt as non-black people do, you know? Um, And that's regardless of whatever community you're in, you know? That dude is uh, um, ethnic origin and his uh, assignment to duty and his will to become a cop was indicative of what we've been um, coached to believe is the true American spirit, you know what I'm saying? But really it's pseudo patriotism, meaning that it's a false form of patriotism. It's um, a myth until it's, you know, our reality, you know, or it's reality until it's our myth. Uh, however you want to look at it, depending on which end of the spectrum you are. But like, uh, in that case, uh, I don't know the cop's name right offhand because it's not on my uh, timeline or whatever at this moment in time, but I've already reposted the article. So if you scroll my timeline, you'll see it. But this dude's got, got charged with intentional murder where his skin tone to me was the reason why him fearing for his safety wasn't a viable defense. So mm-hmm. keep that in mind, yep. man, when you go forward. It's like the best way to combat the justice system is to stay out of it. It's not intended for us to win once we get on the inside of it. And you can't, you know what I'm saying, in the words of uh, Chris Brown, you know what I'm saying? You hating on the outside, and you can't even get in. Well, we trying to stay out of that in. thing. You know what I'm saying? That's mm-hmm. the only way we can come back. Yes. Who they gonna put in jail if we ain't going? Right. <laughs> Straight. Right. Up. right. So, Straight up, man. Hey, and Kevin Smith said, "Why is it hard for police to police the police?" But when a cop sees another cop doing wrong, why does he or she not check that cop on the spot? Hey, man, you know what? They police officers. And I, I keep them. Even at they it. don't want to be snitching. Yeah, they ain't finna snitch on each other either, man. That's their livelihood. So, but that's poor expectation yep. management. If we think that they should be doing that, we'd like to see it. But if they don't, mm-hmm. it don't change the way I move. You know. We shouldn't be surprised. Right. It don't change the way I move. Like I'm not gonna go out here and do something more uh, 
uh, critical or, or risky that jeopardizes my safety and increases the frequency of me interacting with them. I think we just need to stay out of the way. You know what I'm saying? Because we haven't won in any type of situation. Uh, like even when we look at Laquan McDonald, his shooter got six years. And then I watched the dude uh, in my timeline get 35 years for possession of a weapon when he shouldn't have one. But he, that. but that's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Say so, that out loud. So, yeah, exactly, Mar. They're going to use him as their patsy to show the communities they will be enforcing tougher laws against other officers. Yeah, really convenient, right? The timing. You know what I'm yep. saying? It's ridiculous. But on that note, man, I'm going to let you go, man. We've been at this thing for three hours and 20 minutes. Man. Man, don't even feel like it, man. No, it don't, man. They just, they just dope sessions, man. Yeah, absolutely. Dope sessions. Yo, and, and for everybody listening, dope man, sessions, man. Yo, I call my cousin every day, man. I probably talk to him either when I'm on my way to go uh, check on my dogs at, at lunchtime or either on the way back to work from home, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it really goes just like this, man. I'm just glad that y'all were able to see. And, um, you know what I'm saying? We give y'all a small window to... Try to look through it and, you know, chime in with what y'all got to contribute, man. But on that note, it's been another good episode of Code Talk. And this was episode five. Peace. Be real. Man, that was dope, bro. That was hard, man. Three hours? <laughs> bro, <laughs> you know, in that while we was doing that, I cooked the entire meal in the process. <laughs> Man. For my old lady as she walked out the door to go to work.